uh, Wits University of Johannesburg. Uh, we are very interesting, interested to hear a machine learning talk today. Uh, over to Vishnu then. All right, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's been a lovely conference so far. Um, so welcome to my kitchen. Um, it's great to see uh, old trends and uh, some new ones too. Um, so I'd like to discuss some work I've been doing recently on applying uh, machine learning tools to uh, problems in, uh, in our area. Um, so the title here is Machine Learning as a Discovery Tool in HEPTH, but uh, with time, I'd like to uh, change the as to an is and uh, you know, make a preposition to a verb and have this be a, um, a way of uh, learning new aspects of physics. So um, historically, this is probably in the realm of mathematical phenomenology. We know patterns and we look for an explanation. And a prototype example of this in our area is mirror symmetry. So physicists noticed uh, um, in Clavier compactifications, uh, this, this notion that you get the same theory of compactifying on two different Clavials. Clavials had their Hodge numbers uh, interchanged. Um, this was a uh, physics observation before uh, Givental, Liang, Yu, and Yao were able to establish you know, theorems regarding, uh, regarding this. So I'd like to um, use machine learning as a tool to uh, look for patterns and then search for physical and mathematical explanations for these patterns. So um, the uh, machine learning as it, as it is today is a black box. It gives uh, probably approximately correct results. Um, like a good collaborator, it's almost always almost right. And uh, we can use this in order to, uh, to make some progress in addressing uh, some problems. We can filter interesting cases of study and we can start dissecting how the machine is learning and uh, use this as a bridge to, uh, to go from computer results to analytic results and new methods. Uh, but so far, even the machine learning community, the computer science community, there's no deep theoretical understanding for why these techniques work and uh, for which problems a priori uh, we can apply these things. So that's also something which we'll have to discover uh, by experimentation, uh, by trial and error as we proceed. So I'd like to discuss two case studies in, uh, in applying ideas from machine learning in, uh, in our area. One is a uh, relation to knot theory, uh, trying to uh, connect different topological invariants of knots to each other. And the next is in, uh, in QCD. So um, please interrupt me and ask questions if I'm being confusing. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to stop the talk in order to address these questions. All right, so let's start with, uh, with knot theory. Um, the, uh, the idea is that knots are uh, S1s embedded in S3. And here are some very simple knots, uh, the unknot, the trefoil, the figure eight, the syncopoil, and the three twist knot. Um, these, uh, these knots are, um, uh, they can be drawn in many different ways. So the unknot, for example, uh, here are two, two drawings, the unknot, one due to the Bissell weight and one due to uh, OGI. And just by staring at it, you don't realize immediately that this is the unknot. So in order to characterize knots, we use topological invariants, of course. And one topological invariant is a Jones polynomial. The, um, the physics interpretation of the Jones polynomial is it's the vacuum expectation value of the Wilson loop operator along uh, the knot in uh, the, where the trace is taken in the fundamental representation of SU2 for a turn Simon's theory on S3. And uh, for example, for the figure eight knot, uh, I've given uh, the Jones polynomial. The Q is either the two pi i over k plus two, k is the level of the turn Simon's theory, and the two is a dual Coxler number of SU2. So um, that's one, uh, one famous uh, knot invariant with, with an obvious physics interpretation. And, uh, and uh, remove that epsilon ball. The uh, remainder of uh, the S3 um, admits a, uh, a um, the complement has a, uh, has a metric um, which is uh, of constant negative curvature. The volume of uh, the knot complement is a topological invariant um, that's computed using what's called tetrahedral decomposition. And Thurston established this as a, uh, as a topological invariant for, for knots. So not all knots are hyperbolic. Uh, the, the two knots that are, in that are in boxes are hyperbolic examples, but it turns out that most knots, I think all but 31 up to 16 crossings are hyperbolic. 
And that data set contains 1.7 million knots, roughly. So nearly all the knots we're, we're going to be looking at, at small crossing number at least, are of this hyperbolic form. OK. So Witten developed this idea of a colored Jones polynomial, where instead of taking the trace in the fundamental representation of SU2, take the trace in any representation of SU2, the N denotes the color. So the ordinary Jones polynomial is uh, JK comma 2. Um, and Kashayev, Murakami, and Murakami, and Gukov developed what's called the volume conjecture. So you take a large color limit and you evaluate the Jones polynomial, the colored Jones polynomial at uh, the primitive root of unity. Um, then you can compute the volume of the knot complement uh, in this limit. So um, the, uh, an example is, uh, a is a simple hyperbolic knot with 18 crossings. It's simple in the sense that uh, it's um, triangulated, you can compute the volume with a small number of ideal tetrahedra. It's not simple in the sense that uh, it's got small crossing number. Um, so uh, um, Grafalides and Lon uh, were able to compute colored Jones polynomials for this particular knot, K0. And uh, we can see that there is a slow convergence to, uh, to the volume of the knot complement. But the, uh, the initial points uh, corresponding to, uh, to small colors, to low dimensional representations of SU2, uh, are not a very good approximation for the volume. All right. So um, it was noticed that if you take the ordinary Jones polynomial uh, and you evaluate it at minus one, for a certain class of knots, the alternating knots, the log of, uh, of um, the Jones polynomial evaluated at minus one is proportional to the volume of the knot complement. Um, this was an observation to Nathan Dunfield in, uh, in 2000. And uh, Kavanov uh, looked at this and uh, used Kavanov homology and computed the rank in Kavanov homology. So the rank is uh, the sum of the dimensions of uh, uh, the homology groups. And uh, the, um, the homology theory that Kavanov developed explains a mysterious fact about Jones polynomials that the uh, coefficients that appear were all integer, it turns out they're the dimensions of things. So uh, that, that's a natural explanation for, uh, for the properties of this Jones polynomial. Anyway, Kovanov noticed if you compute the rank in, uh, in Kovanov homology, uh, that's also proportional to the volume of the knot complement. So um, there's a theorem, it's called a volumish theorem, the Dazbach and Lin, which says if you take uh, the, um, the coefficients, um, the penultimate coefficients, uh, the maximum degree side, and the minimum degree side of the Jones polynomial, those coefficients establish a bound on the volume of the knot complement. And uh, this, is, um, uh, this bound um, is, uh, is the strongest formal result on uh, the volume of the knot complement and the Jones polynomial that I'm aware of in the literature. Uh, Vishnu, can I ask a question? Uh, in, the, in this volume conjecture, is the leading one over n correction known? Um, I don't believe so. Um, okay. Thank you. Right. The um. Right. So this is this volumeish theorem is uh, the strongest formal result connecting uh, the uh, the volume of the knot complement to. Uh, to uh, the Jones polynomial. So if you take a number from this bound is given by the volumeish theorem and just you know, select that number randomly and compare it to the volume uh, for the alternating knots, uh, you get 100% um, uh, error roughly. So not all knots are alternating in our data set. Uh, I've plotted uh, 15 crossing knots and lower here of our data set, uh, only about a third of them are alternating. So alternating knots uh, interchange over crossing with under crossing when you, uh, when you draw the knot. And if in the large crossing number limit, most knots will not be alternating. So the volume is bound is not a very strong bound on, on the volume. Kovanov homology, if you compute the Kovanov rank for various knots, um, the, uh, these, um, these properties are known for about two thirds of the knots in the data set you find about 5% error when you plot um, the Kovanov uh, rank computation versus the actual volume of the knot. So I presented a number of characters. 
So there's this famous absurdist play by Luigi Pirandello, Six Characters in Search of an Author. In this particular case, I claim the author is a neural network. So neural networks were developed uh, in the late 50s in the Navy Research Lab. Um, so the first model was a perceptron model. A neural network essentially takes an input vector and uh, uses uh, nonlinear functions in, uh, in fitting this to, uh, to some output. So uh, the, um, the typical feedforward neural networks that are used today will have multiple layers. Each of these layers will have uh, multiple neurons in them and uh, there are weight matrices and biases. So you take the input as a vector, you add a bias to it, you rotate this result with a weight matrix. To each element of this uh, new mate of this new vector you you generated, you uh, you apply a nonlinearity, this sigma, and uh, and then you uh, you iterate this over multiple layers, and then you uh, you you attempt to uh, to minimize the error uh, between uh, the prediction of the neural network and uh, the um, the the quantity you desire. In this case, we will be um, we'll be looking at Jones polynomials as inputs and the volumes as the outputs. So the inputs are represented as 18 vectors. So we have is the minimum degree and the maximum degree of the Jones polynomial and all the coefficients that appear in this polynomial. If, uh, if the number of uh, coefficients is, uh, is less than 16, we'll pad the result with zeros at the end. So we apply a two layer neural network. We just use a simple mathematical implementation of this. And uh, we use uh, logistic sigmoid, one over one plus e to the minus x as a nonlinearity in the hidden layers. So this particular network we've constructed has 12,000 hyperparameters. Okay. And these hyperparameters are tuned in the training process. So we take a training data set and uh, we feed it the Jones polynomials. We tell it what the answer is. It tries to optimize the architecture of the neural network to reproduce that answer. And then we test on a new data set that uh, has not been used for training. So that's the philosophy of how this neural network is operating. All right, so we apply this to, uh, to our Jones uh, polynomials. In up to 15 crossings, there are 313,209 hyperbolic knots and uh, training it on 10% of this data and testing on the other 90% of the data, we find uh, the uh, neural network predicts the volume uh, with 97.5% uh, with accuracy. So in fact, if you, uh, if you predict with a tiny amount of data, 0.1% of the data set, 313 out of 313,209 knots, you already improve Kabanov's result in predicting the volume. So a uh, neural network is fantastic in, uh, in predicting the volume based on the Jones polynomial. Vishnu, Vishnu, I think Daniel wants to interrupt and ask you something. Great, please. Yeah, I'm not sure. Do, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so so why why eighteen vectors? Where does this eighteen come from in your input? Eighteen vectors are because up to fifteen crossings, the uh, oh. Jones polynomials have sixteen terms. At most. Okay, okay, it's just because you restrict the, the the not sample to up to fifteen crossings. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so if you go to sixteen crossings, you get similar results, but they're nineteen vectors. Okay, so the training on a tiny amount of data already improves uh, Kabanov's prediction using uh, Kabanov rank. Um, we can see as well that we, we use a two layer neural network. There are 15 neurons in each layer. Um, we can see as well, there's some structure to, uh, to, these, um, to these weight matrices. Um, we find, for example, that in the second layer, the, uh, uh, the largest eigenvalue by absolute value is always uh, a real negative number. Um, this, uh, this may be some generalization of Perron for Venus uh, with the structure of the matrices involved that, that provides this result. So, um, the, uh, the, so with a minimal amount of training, we're already getting very high accuracy in predicting these volumes. So we find essentially the volume is some function of the Jones polynomial plus small corrections. Why are there small corrections? Well, it turns out the Jones polynomial does not uniquely identify a knot. For example, you can have two different uh, knots that have the same Jones polynomial and have different volumes for the knot complements. When this happens, uh, there's about a 3% spread 
in the volumes of the Jones polynomial. Uh, this is good from a computer science perspective in that because of this non-uniqueness, there's an inherent mitigation against overfitting in, uh, in tuning the hyperparameters of this network. Um, we, uh, we notice that uh, the, um, the, the spread is roughly the same as the error in the prediction. So the neural network, because of the spread, is doing as well as we can expect of it. And of course, we see the same behavior with knots up to 16 crossings. This data set consists of uh, 1.7 million knots. Um, the, there are larger data sets of up to, up to 18 crossings in the literature, but we've only looked up to 16 crossings. Uh, these results seem fairly robust as you uh, increase the crossing number. All right, so the neural network does somehow better than more refined topological invariants in predicting the volume. The Jones polynomial is in some sense a quantum object. It's computed in chern simons theory um, using, uh, using usual quantum field theory techniques. Um, whereas the volume is somehow classical. So in some sense, uh, there may be some duality here that, uh, that uh, prevails in, uh, in, in, in computing these things. Um, in large N, uh, we, we may, in the limit of large colors, uh, we may recover a classical limit, but somehow the quantum prediction at N equals two is fairly good at getting us uh, to the volume. There are also various failed experiments here. Um, so for example, if you remove the absolute values in the, uh, in the volume conjecture, you get a generalized volume conjecture where uh, the real part is the volume of the knot complement and the imaginary part is the turn simons invariant to the knot. Um, it turns out that if you try to predict based on the Jones polynomial, the turn simons invariant, you fail completely. Uh, there's essentially, uh, um, you know, the neural network architectures we've used and various other architectures we've tried are unable to predict the turn simons invariant from, uh, from the Jones polynomial. The, the fact that the volume is connected to, um, to some cohomological thing uh, may be the key here. So in you know, various other predictions using machine learning, for example, Fabia Hodge numbers, uh, line bundle cohomology, all, uh, all study this, um, you know, things that are cohomological or homological in nature. Um, it turns out that in the Clavier experiments we've done, uh, whatever the computer is doing, it's doing it in polynomial time. Whereas uh, sequence chasing, Grobner basis calculations, traditional methods of computing these things in algebraic geometry are double the exponential in uh, the size, for example, of the configuration matrix of a container intersection club out. So whatever the machine's doing, it's not doing what a human would do in computing these things. Of course, we'd like to, uh, to use this as a springboard to a not machine learning not result rather than a machine learning result. We'd like some analytic uh, result here. So one might ask, why is this working? And uh, we notice that if you look at n equals three, uh, the adjoint representation of SU2, you compute Jones polynomials in that representation. We're able to compute uh, 11,921 of these colored Jones polynomials. And we can compare the evaluation of uh, J3 versus J2 at the, at the values specified by the volume conjecture. And we find there's a quadratic relationship between J3 and J2. So maybe you know, J2 has enough information to know something about J infinity. And it's this J infinity that's actually related to the volume, but the fact that J2 knows about this is how this whole process is working. So we've tried some more experiments. It turns out that if we drop the minimum and maximum degree and just feed it the coefficients, that's also enough. Uh, we find that the volume is determined only by the coefficients of the Jones polynomial and not by the actual Jones polynomial itself. So these coefficients are uh, dimensions in Kamanov homology, and those dimensions are enough to recover the volume. Um, if you look at binning uh, the volume and compare and comparing coefficients in the Jones polynomial, you'll see plus or minus two is coefficients you know, two from one end and, my, and two from the other end, and three from one end and three from the other end, and so on. You find that their power laws these coefficients display with respect to the volume. So, you know, maybe this is the kind of thing a neural network is learning. So we're trying to disentangle what the neural network is doing in order to, to uh, produce analytic results. So this is work, that, work that's in progress. 
All right, so the initial paper on this uh, was with, written with Arjun Kaur and Ankar Parikar, who were both at UPenn at the time. Uh, Arjun has since moved on to UBC, Ankar is in, uh, in Stanford. And uh, the more recent work I've been doing in, in collaboration with Arjun and uh, my student, Jessica Craig. All right, so this is a natural place to pause and ask you if there are any questions on knots before I start talking about QCD. All right, so let me continue. Can I just ask quickly? So yes. what was the size of your data set, like the training and the test data set combined? The training, the complete data set was 300,000 knots, roughly, for uh, um, 313,209 knots at 15 crossings. I see. I see. The same results apply at 16 crossings to 1.7 million knots. It's just, uh, it takes longer to compute these things. So I don't have a curve like this uh, for 16 crossings. But, um, you know, I've looked at 16 crossings up to about 20% for the training site. I see. But even so, a very, very tiny fraction is enough in order to get results. So there is a formula to look for uh, if, uh, if this is what's, what's happening. Okay, let me continue then. Let me talk about um, masses in QCD. So um, as this is, uh, as David Gross is the guest of honor at this conference, uh, this is an entirely appropriate thing to talk about. We're all well aware that QCD is, uh, is mysterious in the confining regime. And we'd like to understand some aspects of uh, physics in, in the confining regime. So, um, uh, the, uh, the states I'll be looking at primarily are mesons and baryons. And uh, the key observation is that um, you know, most of a hadron's mass arises in strong coupling effects, namely whatever's happening in confinement. And uh, Witten observed in the late 70s that in large N, we can think about baryons as solitonic excitations in the meson spectrum. So mesons are essentially free particles with couplings of order one over N, and the baryons are monopole-like excitations with masses of order n in this n goes to infinity limit. So we like to see whether n equals three is enough in, uh, in, in order to, uh, to make similar statements. So the idea is that we'll have 196 mesons and 43 baryons, whose properties we take from the particle data book. And uh, we'll include uh, the properties that we have for as large a data set as possible. So we'll include isospin, angular momentum, and parity. We don't include G parity. Uh, we don't include uh, uh, charge parity. We don't include width due to uh, incompleteness in, uh, in the data set. So what we'll do is we'll optimize the architecture of the neural network based on training with 80% of the mesons. And uh, we'll try to predict the masses of the mesonic data set and also the baryonic data set. The baryonic data set is not involved at all in the training process. We're training purely on mesons and we're seeing whether uh, we can predict the masses of baryons. And uh, you know, if, if we can do this, uh, this uh, corroborates um, this idea that baryons are in fact solitons in the meson spectrum. We'll also use the neural network to predict tetraquark and pentaquark masses uh, and discriminate different composition hypotheses for tetraquarks. So let me explain what we're doing. So we'll fix the architecture using 80% of the mesons. Uh, we'll include a vector, which essentially uh, tells us what the valence quark composition is of the mesons. And we'll include the i, j, and the p quantum numbers. Um, because the data sets are small, we'll try to uh, use as small a neural network as possible for interpretability reasons. Uh, it turns out that logistic sigmoids work best in the hidden layer. There are 700 hyperparameters in this neural network. We'll also use what's called a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process uh, was actually invented not too far away from where I am right now. Um, a fellow named Danny Kriege uh, was looking at um, the most likely gold distribution uh, based on some Bohr samples taken near here and, uh, and developed the Gaussian process, which was also developed by Wiener and Komogorov as, as a method for uh, statistical inference and uh, prediction. It turns out that neural networks in, uh, in the limit where there's a single hidden layer and uh, 
uh, an infinite width um, for this layer, so infinite number of neurons in this layer, um, the Gaussian process is this particular limit of a neural network. All right, so the idea here is that we choose some kernel function. This kernel function consists of a diagonal matrix. The diagonal matrix is, uh, has as many entries as in the vector we use in the neural network. So in our case, there are 13 uh, uh, entries in the diagonal matrix. And there are certain free parameters, uh, alpha, uh, sigma f, and sigma n. And we maximize the log marginal likelihood, uh, the expression at the bottom of the slide, to, to fix these hyperparameters. And based on this uh, the setup, we're able to use this Gaussian process to, uh, to predict the mean and the variance. So we're essentially training on the quark content and certain quantum numbers in order to predict the mass of the particle. So the, to illustrate what the Gaussian process is doing, um, the, uh, the red curve is uh, the function sine pi over two over, um, times x. And we're giving it certain data points, the blue crosses in this figure. And we're choosing a certain functions that are drawn from prior with zero mean. And then we fix the hyperparameters in order to, uh, to optimize performance. And once we do this, we have some posterior. In the Gaussian process posterior, this, uh, this green uh, envelope, uh, functions taken from this green envelope um, have 99% confidence of reproducing uh, the, um, the predictions. Um, the, uh, the variance increases the further away you get from the points that you feed the Gaussian process. All right, so our neural network uh, consisting of uh, 50 neurons uh, with one layer and this, uh, this logistic sigmoid um, is trained on the mesons and it predicts the meson mass up to, uh, to 13%. This 13% error excludes the pions uh, associated to chiral symmetry breaking. So it's the, uh, it's the error associated to everything else. Uh, the blue dots are the, uh, the predictions in the neural network for, for the mesons uh, after you know, we, we, the errors are obtained from running 1,000 training runs. The orange dots I'll come to momentarily. For the baryons, given this trained network, we just apply it on baryonic data, we find the uh, less than 10% error in predicting the masses of baryons. So these baryons cluster, there are these uh, you know, down, up, and strange quark composed baryons. There's a family of charm baryons and a family of uh, bottom uh, uh, baryons. Uh, of course, top hadronizes too quickly in order to form bound states. So um, the uh, the over a thousand runs, we see that the, uh, the predictions of uh, the neural network do indeed follow a normal distribution. So, uh, so using standard deviations, et cetera, are justified by, uh, by this um, uh, property. So the orange dots correspond to the constituent quark model. The constituent quark model is, uh, well, it's model dependent. So it's, there's no one constituent quark model, there's several. I've chosen a particular one here. Um, here, the constituent quark model computes the QCD binding energy. It's the amount of energy to, um, you need to add to spontaneously emit a meson containing a given valence quark. Um, the, uh, if you apply the, the values of this particular constituent quark model to, uh, to the mesonic, the veronic data set, the neural network uh, outperforms on the mesons and slightly underperforms on, on the baryons. But they're very comparable in, uh, in the air. The Gaussian process, uh, which which we uh, which we employ in, in, in training on uh, on the um, the mesons, we find a uh, thirteen percent error compared to thirty nine percent error for the constituent work model, and the baryons uh, the error is is much smaller than the constituent work model. Um, and we're using uh, a kernel which only contains seventeen hyperparameters to fix, so it's uh, it's uh, it's not overfitting anything. We also find that uh, among the light baryons, the proton is predicted to be the lightest particle um, with, uh, in 79% of the cases. And in the plurality of cases, the neutron is the second lightest of the baryons. Um, the actual mass predictions, well, the error bars are rather high. So it's difficult to actually compare 
to, uh, to the data. Um, but, you know, the numbers are comparable to uh, the constituent quark model predictions as well. Um, the, uh, the neural network, the, so particle numbering, the particle data groups numbering scheme treats pi zero, which is really a combination of DD bar and UU bar as DD bar, the data set. Um, the proton is UUD, neutron is UDD. Naively, you'd expect neutron to be lighter, uh, but the, um, the neural network learns its subtlety and realizes the proton is, is lightest. Um, okay, so LHCB has uh, discovered kind of quark resonances and uh, neural network predictions and the Gaussian process predictions um, are comparable to uh, um, the actual uh, measured masses of these particles and also comparable to the constitutional work model. The tetra quarks, um, which have not been discovered at, at five sigma, um, there are various different composition hypotheses for the resonances that have been seen. Uh, some of these composition hypotheses are in fact molecular bound states of mesons. Um, other composition hypotheses are just very excited mesons. It turns out that the neural network and the Gaussian process both favor the, uh, the non tetra quark hypothesis for these predictions. So, you know, one of the utilities uh, of this, uh, this process is to discriminate between the various composition hypotheses. All right, so what's going on physically? We know that there's an analog problem in, in nuclear physics. Um, it's, uh, it's to determine the masses of nucleons. And there's a semi-empirical mass formula due to, uh, to Weizsäcker uh, that, um, and Hans Bethe that, um, that predicts these, uh, these, um, these masses by knowing uh, the, uh, the number of protons and the number of neutrons uh, in, uh, in, this particular, in a particular isotope. And their contributions from the volume, the surface, Coulomb interactions, and so on. Um, so machine learning experiments suggest there's a similar formula based on the valence quark input and these few quantum numbers. Um, so how do we find such a formula? Well, the formula is going to be of a different character than some of the empirical mass formula we encountered in nuclear physics. Um, in, in a sense, uh, in the nucleus, the density doesn't increase with the number of particles. And in fact, the binding energy terms become negligible as uh, the proton and neutron numbers get large. Whereas in the baryon case, the interaction energy grows with that. So the formula is you know, of a different character and perhaps more complicated than we've encountered in the liquid drop model. There is a result in uh, computer science called the universal approximation theorem. Suppose some complicated formula exists, then uh, the, um, the feed forward neural network with a sigmoid activation function as we've been using, with a single hidden layer as we've been using, with a finite number of neurons can approximate continuous functions on subsets of Rn. The surprise here though, is the simplicity. We only have 50 neurons for a small data set of 196 mesons used for training. Um, the, uh, if you look at what the weights, which weights are strongest in, uh, in these weight matrices, which, which things are weighted most heavily, it looks like charm and bottom and then isospin uh, are the most uh, important factors in determining the masses. Now, without training on antibaryon, without, without telling uh, the uh, neural network that a particle and its antiparticle should have the same mass, uh, it predicts anti-baryon masses within 6% of the baryon masses. Uh, so machine learning figures out antiparticles on its own. And this is somehow non-trivial because we know that uh, mesons are, uh, um, are bosons. Uh, so the parity of an antiparticle is the same as the parity of a particle. Whereas for fermions, the parity of an antiparticle and the parity of a particle differ by a sign. Um, so it's training on purely mesonic data and learning a feature of baryons in order to get the mass correct. If you just you know, drop the parity, the predictions become much, much worse. So it's in fact learning this, this attribute of, uh, of um, QCD. All right, so um, the, uh, you know, why should we expect this to work for, for n equals three? And the usual argument is that uh, you know, there are small parameters and uh, the uh, you know, one over n squared may be good enough at n equals three. And uh, machine learning, baryon spectrum for the mesons and real world QCD is consistent with Witten's picture. All right, so we'd like to, uh, to see whether we can take this further. 
Uh, so we're thinking about glue balls. We know that A tensor A and A tensor A tensor A uh, have singlets. So these are like um, we can predict, uh, maybe use labs predictions uh, to, to do some training and compare it to whatever electron ion colliders we'll see. Uh, we can try to learn uh, Reggie trajectories and the origin of string theory in some sense, um, the dual resonance model, uh, where J versus M squared was approximately linear. We haven't looked at higher resonances here. So that's something that we're, we're, uh, we're going to look at. Um, the Gelman Okubo mass formula, their coefficients there, uh, essentially is a hadron mass relation uh, with strangeness or equivalently hypercharge and isospin. We can try to see whether we can determine what the coefficients are and compare it to the Gelman Okubo formula. Um, you know, these methods are much faster than Lattice QCD, but it certainly doesn't supplant it. Lattice QCD makes better predictions than neural networks do. It's just that, you know, my neural network, I can run it in minutes on my laptop, whereas uh, Lattice QCD calculations are measured in graduate student years. Uh, as a result, you know, uh, there are trade-offs, but um, that's where we are currently. So this is work I did with Yaron Gall, who's at Oxford University, uh, Damien Marada Pena, who's a postdoc at BITS, and Challenger Mishra, who's also at Oxford University. All right, so in these case studies, we've seen a black box, a neural network, or a Gaussian process, uh, that's succeeding at making certain predictions of relevance to, to us in uh, high energy theoretical physics. So we, we have a question though, how is this all working and uh, how, do we, um, how do we proceed uh, in, in figuring this out and disentangling what the machine is doing? In other words, how does a black box learn semantics without knowing any syntax? Um, I think in this case, things that are generally unpublished and they failed experiments uh, may help. If we can determine what works and what doesn't work, that may give us a clue as to why things work when they do. Um, and you know, we're searching for analytic expressions, especially for Jones polynomial uh, and the volume in, uh, in, in doing this. Uh, but there's a deeper question here. Can artificial intelligence do interesting research? Um, in some sense, the answer is yes. You know, we know that AlphaGo has invented uh, new openings in, in Go. Uh, there are new Josiki, new opening sequences uh, that humans haven't developed. Uh, the computers are much more proficient at, at generating. Uh, but the state of the art is in, in real analysis. Uh, Ganesha Lingam and Gowers uh, tried to, um, to teach proofs. And the proofs that the machine produces at the level of a first year graduate course in real analysis, a special mathematician cannot distinguish a computer generated proof from a graduate student's proof. Um, and, you know, Vavodsky has been uh, promulgating the idea that proof assistance will be uh, a way to, uh, to proceed in mathematics. And this is all, you know, thematically related to this note. <laughs> Uh, we were using um, uh, a data set. So, uh, we tried to classify papers into archive categories. And we found that um, with 65% success, we were able to get the exact subheading. And with 87% with, you know, success, we were able to discriminate between formal papers and phenomenology papers. The way this proceeds is essentially by mapping words to vectors in some high dimensional vector space, some uh, say R400. And in linguistics, um, you know, we've used this, people have used this to discover certain syntactic identities. So Paris minus France plus Italy, well, that's Rome. King minus man plus woman, that's queen. So as an experiment, we try to apply this to, uh, um, to words in heptiage. And we find that there are sensible syntactic relationships we describe in this way. So symmetry plus black hole, well, that's killing. Symmetry plus algebra is a group. Black hole plus QCD is a plasma. Uh, space time and inflation is a cosmological constant. String theory plus Clavier is the same as M theory plus G2. So there's some hope that we can use these no sort of notions as an idea generating machine. Um, in fact, I'd like to take all the papers that appeared before uh, the famous uh, holography papers in 1997 and see whether those papers are able to predict you know, ADS-CFT. So, um, so uh, I'd be curious to see whether uh, these, uh, these sorts of um, ideas are somehow embedded into the literature already, and we can use this as a tool as well. 
So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Vishnu, for this uh, nice talk. Um, there is time for questions and comments. So uh, Ayan has a couple of questions. So let us start with Ayan. Okay. Vishnu, great talk. So I have a question about uh, if you said that somehow the large end limit is uh, perhaps being guessed by the neural network. So is there a way to directly test that? Of course, it might be hard to take uh, some late lattice data, say for n is equal to seven or something. But uh, but do, do have you thought about like if uh, if one can somehow check it? I know that Matt Tepper, for example, at Oxford does have lattice data at different values of n and different dimensions as well. That might be a place to to look. I, don't, I haven't actually tried, so I don't know. Uh, but um, there's possibilities for doing this. Um, you know, one thing that um, has been looked at is uh, um, is using the ADS QC dictionary uh, blindly in some sense and, uh, and extracting information uh, about QCD through uh, machine learning that way. Koji Hashimoto in particular has been looking at this. Um, so, you know, there are, there may be uh, openings here as well. And uh, there's certain Heavy missions are very well predicted. The masses are very well predicted analytically by techniques like NRQCD, for example. I think. So, uh, how do how, how does the machine learning do with these things? Uh, I don't know. Actually, I haven't tried. I don't know. That's an interesting okay. idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sayantan has uh, a question. So, Sayantan, you can ask. Hi, Vishnu, I was wondering uh, whether uh, your algorithm can predict uh, the eta and eta prime meson mass splitting because uh, they are related to the anomalies. So, how do this algorithm know about the anomalies? Just starting from the quantum numbers. Um, right. Um, it shouldn't, based on what it knows, but uh, I haven't. I mean, we have the data. I can I can have a look and let you know. Um, but uh, you know, eta eta prime were part of the data set. Um, I I don't remember offhand how how well they predicted. It. I can check. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And uh, can I ask a related question? Sure. Uh, yeah. So it was following up on Ian's question. So there are. Um, Quark model uh, predictions from uh, that many people use. Um, they usually predict all the resonances and um, and all these um, higher mass uh, mesons and baryons. And usually they found, uh, find out that there are many missing states uh, which are not found in the experiments, like especially for the baryons, the strange two and strange three baryons. There are lots of them um, which are not found out in the experiment. There are some experiments uh, in JLab which are planning to look at it. But uh, there is a huge uh, debate on these. So is your algorithm looking on those uh, states also, like uh, higher mass baryons, like spin, uh, sorry, strangeness to baryons, which are heavier mass? And are there any predictions from there? We haven't looked yet. Um, so as a student in Oxford, Orlin Kimball, who uh, who we're working with now um, in, in you know some of, some of the um, topics that I mentioned uh, here, uh, but you know those those are things we can look at as well. Uh, it's um, I don't have any, anything beyond what I just talked about to present, but there are lots of interesting ideas to explore in this space. Um, I uh, we're looking, but we have we don't have anything solid to say yet. Thanks, and thanks for this. I don't hear anything. Is there a question? Someone was speaking and they were cut off on my end. Uh, no, no. Uh, so yeah, I was. He was just simply saying that it was a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, could talk, I think that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, more questions, comments.
okay if not uh, let's thank uh, vishnu uh, once again for the nice talk um so we clap okay thanks vishnu bye so um so ayan how do we do our next speaker is uh, bidisha and she is here yeah yeah you, the vidisha should simply start uh, sharing her screen okay so uh, vidisha can you hear me uh yes uh, i will just uh, share my screen yeah the vidisha can probably continue her talk until matthew appears <laughs> of course if it goes beyond <laughs> yeah actually the third speaker has not uh, appeared so far and uh, uh, he might be late okay. so okay so shall we start or uh, i am um, yeah yeah sure sure the... sure you are in charge you are in charge okay okay Okay, perfect. So, uh, so we are very happy to have Bidisha and Bidisha Chakrabarti from Southampton. Uh, she will be telling us about uh, OTO effective dynamics of a quartic oscillator. Okay, Bidisha, over to you. Uh, Bidisha, we cannot hear you. Yeah, I think log uh, back in. She log out. Yeah. Log, she just log back in. Let's wait a little bit. Uh, sorry, what happened? Internet, internet problem. Yeah, I think she has to log back in because uh, uh, she has been logged out somehow. Yeah, it takes a little while to log back in if you are logged out. <laughs> it takes us. Yeah, Zoom yeah. has this issue. I think it takes about three, four minutes sometimes. Yeah, yeah. To get. Yeah. Actually, my internet at the beginning of this session, my internet was not working, and it took me almost ten minutes to get back. Yeah, Zoom has an issue about it doesn't uh, allow you in very easily <laughs> if you want to get out. Uh, hi, I think I just got disconnected. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, sorry about this. I don't know. Suddenly it stopped working. Actually, we are still perfectly on time. Yeah, we are ahead yeah. of time. <laughs> That's why it takes. Uh... Yeah, it's good to have some gap between the between the talks. Yeah. Okay. So, can you uh, uh, can you see my screen now? Ah, uh, yes, we can see your screen, Vidisha. Okay. So maybe I can start. Ah, uh, yes. So let me introduce you once again. So we are very happy to have Vidisha uh, from Southampton. She will be telling us about uh, OTO effective dynamics of a quartic oscillator. Okay, Vidisha, you can start. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me in this wonderful conference. and i'm very privileged to give a talk in honor of professor david cross so i will be talking about out of time ordered effective dynamics of a quartic oscillator this appeared in a paper in last year with shomodeep choudhury who was a student at icts uh, where i was a former postdoc so here is the plan of my talk in the introduction i will give a brief motivation for the for the work and uh, also outline our work briefly so basically we study an effective theory of a quantum brownian particle which is weakly interacting with a thermal bath via cubic interactions and this uh, effective theory uh, has a description in terms of a classical stochastic dynamics the classical stochastic dynamics as we will see 
is governed by a nonlinear Langevin equation. However, this uh, classical stochastic description or the corresponding quantum effective theory is uh, insufficient to determine the out of time ordered correlators of the particle. To determine out of time ordered correlators of the particle, we have to extend the effective theory framework, which we have done. And uh, we have also explored various constraints that are imposed on this effective theory of the particle coming from symmetries of the microscopic theory. And uh, as we will see, so this symmetries of the microscopic theory will be essentially time reversal invariance and thermality. And combining all these constraints on the effective theory coming from microscopic theory, uh, we will be able to generalize the well-known fluctuation dissipation relations for the out of time ordered dynamics. And then finally, I will just summarize and uh, discuss some future directions. So time ordered correlators are uh, very well explored objects in the study of particle scattering where you have a bunch of incoming and outgoing states and uh, they interact in between and uh, one can calculate time ordered correlation functions and also to study the behavior of quantum systems under small perturbations, etc. However, much less is known about out of time ordered correlators and this is mainly because they are more difficult to compute and measure. And also diagrammatic techniques for computing OTOCs are not very well developed. However, OTOCs are useful quantities to study as their connection to scrambling, quantum chaos, thermalization, et cetera, has been realized uh, by Malda, Sina, Schenke, Stanford, and many, other, many others. So this might be only the tip of an iceberg about OTOCs. And uh, uh, as we will see that there can be new insights coming from OTOCs. So it is actually very useful to uh, study out of time ordered correlators and compute them systematically. Now the problem of computing OTOCs simplifies when the operators appearing in the OTOC act only on a subset of degree of freedom. And this subset of degrees of freedom will be used to define an open quantum system. And this open quantum system acts as a probe which is coupled to a environment which is much more complex with many number of degrees of freedom. However, one can implement effective theory techniques by integrating out the environment when uh, in situations when it is actually possible. Uh, you can actually Im implement uh, techniques of effective theory either by integrating out the environment or just by making use of the symmetries available at hand to compute out of time ordered correlators of the probe. So the simplest example of such an open quantum system is a Brownian oscillator, which is interacting with a thermal bath. And effective theories for such a Brownian particle interacting with various thermal baths have been derived by Feynman, Vernon, Caldera, Legate, and others in the past. And the effective action of the particle is obtained by integrating out the bath's degrees of freedom. So when the Brownian particle is actually linearly coupled to a harmonic bath, uh, it means that the coupling between uh, particle and bath degrees of freedom are bilinear, then the particle's effective theory becomes quadratic. And this is the well-known caldera legate model. So they had actually considered such a microscopic theory where particle was linearly coupled to the bath oscillators, and they integrated out the bath degrees of freedom and constructed the effective theory of the Brownian particle. Uh, and that effective theory was a quadratic effective theory. So this effective theory, uh, has a classical stochastic description given by linear Langevin dynamics that they observed. Uh, this equation is the Langevin equation where you have, so this is uh, gamma is the damping constant of the Brownian particle, mu, mu bar is the denormalized frequency of the Brownian particle. This is the random force or noise, uh, curly n. Uh, and uh, the probability distribution of this noise in this case is a Gaussian. And uh, this f square is really the variance of the noise per unit mass. And in thermal equilibrium, noise and dissipation terms are related by fluctuation dissipation relation, which is here. Uh, beta is the inverse temperature. And uh, the classical argument by Einstein, the way first it was realized, uh, was like when the particle interacts with the bath oscillators, then it dissipates energy. And the dissipation will be proportional to the number of uh, oscillators in the bath. And on the other hand, because the bath is a thermal bath, it has thermal noise. And the energy coming from the noise is proportional to the number of oscillators in the bath times half kBT. And in thermal equilibrium, these two energies have to compensate for each other. And from there, first, uh, this kind of a relation was um, realized. And uh, so path integral in this uh, stochastic problem is really related to a quantum path integral. Path integral and this was the main idea of the Calder-Legate model. 
Now, uh, in a previous work at ICTS, uh, I with uh, Shomodip and Logan Agam had considered a perturbation over the caldera legate model by introducing a weak cubic interaction in the microscopic theory. So we allowed for a cubic interaction in the microscopic theory between the oscillator degree of freedom, the Brownian particle degree of freedom, and the bath oscillators. And in this case, the effective theory we write down will no longer be quadratic. It will have higher order terms. So in this paper, we considered up to cubic terms in the effective action, cubic in the number of uh, cubic in the degree of freedom of the Brownian particle Q. And uh, also we have extended uh, this cubic uh, effective theory up to the next order, which is quartic order. Uh, and this is the work that I will be most, uh, discussing on today. And uh, in this case, the effective theory is actually described by, has a description in, term, uh, in terms of a nonlinear generalization of linear Langevin equation. However, as we will see that the nonlinear Langevin theory or the quantum effective action is insufficient to determine out of time ordered correlators of the particle. And we have extended the effective theory framework further to be able to compute OTOCs of the particle. And uh, if the bath has microscopic time reversal invariance and thermality, then it will impose further constraints on the effective action. And these constraints between various uh, effective couplings in the action give rise to generalizations of fluctuation dissipation relation in the quartic case, quartic effective theory case. So now I will go on to discuss our microscopic uh, theory. Uh, so the model is like this. Uh, so you have uh, free Lagrangian for the Brownian particle, uh, degree of freedom with degree of freedom Q. MP0 is the bare mass. And then you have free Lagrangian coming from the bath. So basically, now we consider a thermal bath, which is made of two kinds of oscillator, X and Y. So uh, we, uh, these are the free Lagrangians coming from bath oscillators. And then we will allow for a very small cubic interaction in this microscopic theory, which is of the form QXY. IJ are oscillator degrees of freedom, and lambda is a very small coupling constant. So the operator that acts on the Hilbert space of the bath in this case and couples to Q will be this uh, XY, uh, this, this is the bath operator. And uh, in, in this QXY model, higher point connected parts of correlators of this bath operator will be non-zero because in the microscopic theory, you allow for a cubic interaction. So you can write down your effective theory order by order in lambda. And uh, all, all this, uh, this the, because of this microscopic theory, in the effective theory, you have higher than two point, um, uh, two point uh, higher than uh, second degree terms in Q in the effective theory. And uh, thermal uh, connected parts of correlators, which we call cumulants uh, of Q will contribute to this eff effective action. And we will consider, as I mentioned, up to quartic terms in the effective action. So this is the microscopic theory we, we started with. And notice that in the, this microscopic theory has a symmetry under Q going to minus Q, X going to X or Q going to minus Q, Y going to Y. And because of the symmetry in the microscopic theory, the effective theory in this model for Q will just have even degree terms in Q and all odd degree terms in Q should vanish. Let me also uh, tell what is the initial state. So initially we assume that the probe and the bath are unentangled. So the initial density matrix, the full density matrix just factorized between the bath and the probe density matrix. And since the bath is in a thermal state, so it's uh, the density matrix is re really written in terms of thermal partition functions. And uh, so just after this T naught time, when these two were not interacting with each other, we turn on this small cubic interaction that I mentioned just after T naught. Now, uh, we will also assume the cu couplings uh, that appear in this QXY model to have to follow proper distribution functions. So basically the uh, quadratic coupling, uh, we will uh, take the distribution for that to be of this form and the quartic coupling, uh, the distribution of that to be of this form where mu x and mu y are really frequencies of x and y oscillators. Capital omega is a UV regulator. Gamma two, gamma four are some constants. So I will just motivate why we choose a dis proper distribution for these couplings. Uh, because, uh, so if you integrate out the bath degrees of freedom starting from this microscopic theory, and you write down the effective action for the particle, then the effective action in general is non-local in time. However, for particular distribution of bath oscillators, the bath correlation functions evaluated with respect to those distributions of oscillators, bath correlation functions will decay very, very fast. In this case, exponentially fast. And once the bath correlators decay exponentially fast, if you wait for that uh, time scale and uh, study your effective theory after that, 
then the effective theory will become local in time. So this is the motivation for studying these kind of distributions. And uh, with respect to this kind of distributions, the bath correlation functions will decay exponentially fast where the time scale is set by capital omega inverse, which is the smallest time scale in the theory. So capital omega inverse is much, much uh, smaller time scale compared to any other time scale in the evolution of the particle. So uh, bath correlators in this model will decay exponentially fast, as I mentioned. And we will also work in a very high temperature limit where uh, beta omega is much, much less than one. So beta is the inverse temperature. And this will uh, just make sure, as I discussed, that uh, the bath time scale correlation function decays time scale will be set by capital omega inverse uh, and nothing else. Because in general, uh, in, in this uh, theory, for example, there are contributions to bath correlators from Matsubara modes as well. But if we work in this particular regime, then those modes will be suppressed. I mean, the slowest decaying mode in the bath correlation function will be determined by capital omega inverse scale. So that's why just for a simplification, we will work in this limit. And uh, since the bath correlators decay, the information about the particle is quickly forgotten by the bath. And the effective dynamics of the particle will become local in time, which has a name. It is called the Markovian regime. And uh, so we have to choose our parameters accordingly so that we are in this regime. So this gamma, which was the damping constant of the particle, and mu naught bar, which was the bare frequency of the particle, should be much, much less than this capital omega, which has dimensions of frequency. And also time scales associated to this gamma 2 and gamma 4 are much larger com compared to omega inverse time scale. So omega inverse is really the smallest time scale in the theory. So uh, we have written down this local effective uh, theory, and uh, we have uh, really uh, studied the saddle point of that theory. Uh, and what we see that uh, now the effective theory has a description in terms of a nonlinear generalization of Langevin equation. So this is the nonlinear Langevin equation, uh, where you see that there are correction terms on top of each term. So n is really the thermal noise. Mu bar is now the renormalized frequency. Gamma is the, these are the standard terms which were also there in the linear Langevin case, which I discussed in the context of caldera legate model. But now there are correction terms like zeta gamma, which is the thermal jitter in damping constant, zeta mu, which is jitter in renormalized frequency. And then there are these parameters in the Langevin equation, which are really anharmonicity parameters. And in this case, the probability distribution of the noise is no longer a Gaussian. It has a non-Gaussianity coming from the zeta n term. And zeta is some uh, uh, effect uh, which introduces color in the noise. So notice that all these correction parameters are really order lambda 4 parameters and they're very small. So if you ignore these parameters, you get back the Langevin equation, linear Langevin equation with a Gaussian noise. So I uh, sorry, can I, can I interrupt? I have a very urgent question. So uh, since you have a non-Gaussian noise, uh, there should be also a generalization of the FDR, no? The fluctuation dissipation relation. Yes, yes. There is a generalization of the FDR, which I will discuss in my following slides. Okay, thank that. you. Thank you. Yeah. So essentially, this FDR, as we will see, will relate this non-Gaussianity in the noise, zeta n, and the jitter in the damping constant of the particle, which is zeta gamma. But interesting and curious fact is that we have discovered this relationship, uh, not for a specific model, but in general. Uh, uh, via going uh, in the uh, out of time ordered uh, generalization. I mean, just looking at the zeta gamma and zeta n in this equation, we did not know that there is a relation between them. But uh, when we studied the, the out of time ordered generalization of the effective theory, then we realized that there has to be a relation between these two, which I will discuss. Um, so uh, uh, I will quickly, uh, quickly discuss how the effective theory is constructed from the microscopic theory, let's say. So after the particle bath, uh, weak interaction is turned on. So particles evolution is governed by the effective action. Uh, and the effective action will be constructed in the schwinger keldysh path integral formalism on a closed time fold contour. So uh, to start with, what we have to do, since uh, this is a path integral contour, it has two legs. Uh, actually, the initial condition is in terms of initial density matrix of the full system, bath and probe. And then the, there has to be doubling of degrees of freedom of probe and bath so that the kth piece of the initial density matrix is evolved along this leg. And the bra piece of the initial density matrix is evolved, uh, reverse uh, time, uh, time evolved back in the other leg. So there has to be two copies living on these two legs of the schwinger keldysh contour. That's why doubling of degrees of freedom, because you are studying evolution of density matrix and not just a single state. Uh, 
so basically uh, uh, so the uh, this is the microscopic lagrangian and we will start with in the microscopic theory two copies of it given some initial uh, density metrics uh, and then we will integrate over this xy degrees of freedom which are bath degrees of freedom and that way we will get the effective action for q or the corresponding reduced density metrics for the particle so as i already discussed this effective action is in general non local in time and coefficients of various terms in the effective action are basically given by contour ordered correlators of bath operator because you are integrating over bath you are writing down effective action for particle the terms various terms come with coefficients and these coefficients are precisely determined by contour ordered correlators of o now since the bath correlators decay exponentially fast in in the particular mod model chosen or for uh, this kind of suitable models uh, the uh, effective action becomes local in time and we will keep at most first time derivative on q in this effective theory because all the higher time derivatives in the effective theory will be suppressed by this o, 1 by capital omega which is a very small number now correlators of the particle calculated from microscopic theory can also be obtained from a 1 pi 1 particle irreducible effective action because given the symmetries that the microscopic theory is unitary and the further symmetries that i mentioned under q going to minus q x going to minus x so that your effective theory only has you know even power, even powers of q so given these symmetries uh, you can also write down the most general structure of effective theory what you will not know is what is the arbitrary coefficient that appear in front of various terms in the effective theory but given that you also have a handle uh, on the microscopic theory for the weakly coupled case eventually you will be able to relate this arbitrary coefficients in front of various terms of this effective theory in terms of bath correlators which was way one that i discussed already so we have done that so from the symmetries also we are able to write down the most general form of the effective theory so this is the quadratic uh, form of uh, schwinger keldysh effective theory uh, where a and d are really average and difference degrees of freedom which are really uh, this q1 and q2 where uh, de are degrees of freedom that are actually living on the this two legs of the schwinger keldysh contour and there is a relative minus sign this is a convention where i am just taking my degrees of freedom on the even legs with the extra minus sign and the quartic term in the effective theory is uh, given by equation 11 and uh, remember that these are the essentially the parameters that were also appearing in the nonlinear langevin equation and we have been able to show the equivalence of this quantum path integral with the classical stochastic nonlinear langevin equation uh, nonlinear langevin description by doing a appropriate noise integral which i can discuss uh, maybe towards the end uh, when I, if i have more time uh, so this is what the effective theory looks like for the quartic terms Uh, and the important thing to notice is that there is no term in the effective action where q average or its derivative appears alone because uh, this will be crucial to make sure that if you identify the two legs uh, of the uh, two uh, the degrees of freedom on the two legs of the schwinger keldysh contour then the effective action must vanish this is just coming from unitarity of the microscopic theory and this will be ensured once there is no qa or its derivative appearing alone in the effective theory now since we we can uh, calculate correlators of the particle uh, from the effective theory which we got via um, microscopic theory integra integrating out the degrees of freedom of the bath and also we have effective theory just constructed from symmetries and we can ca also calculate correlators of the particle from that that so these two, two ways of doing we compare these correlators of the particle calculated from one pi effective action as well as from microscopic theory so this will give this uh, schwinger keldysh effective couplings in the effective theory in terms of bath correlation functions or bath spectral functions which are just frequency domain expression for the um, commutators of uh, you know time domain uh, bath correlation functions so you can also write them in frequency domain and this row 1 to row 1 to 3 4 are really the spectral functions of the bath so essentially the effective couplings can be expressed in terms of the spectral functions of the bath so here is the expression for various quadratic effective couplings um here written in terms of bath spectral functions these are the quadratic couplings and written in leading order in large temperature uh, and also you can evaluate them for the particular model considered where i mentioned the distribution of bath oscillators via uh, those uh, specific distributions so you can evaluate them explicitly and you have this uh, values uh, and note that this c2 is a complexified contour in complex omega plane uh, where uh, this contour is chosen and making sure that the energy conservation is pre preserved uh, like omega 1 plus omega 2 Uh, uh delta of omega 1 plus omega 2 now uh so also note that uh, there is a there is a relation between f square and gamma at the level of the integral 
Uh, and this is the fluctuation dissipation relation, standard fluctuation dissipation relation known between noise and dissipation uh, at the level of quadri quadratic effective coupling. And we have also calculated all our quartic nonlinear Langevin parameters in terms of bath correlation functions. I have just mentioned one of these relations here, but we have all the expressions in our paper. And uh, you can evaluate these uh, correlators given the particular distribution at hand, and uh, you get all of these values. And note that uh, at least for the particular model at hand, you can see in the table that this non-Gaussianity in the noise uh, is related to the value of the jitter in the damping constant of the particle. So at least at the level of the, um, you know, at this point, at the level of the model, you, uh, one should be convinced that uh, these two parameters are related. Now, uh, schwinger keldysh path integral is used to study lots of interesting phenomena. It's very successful. However, it is not enough to develop an effective theory framework to calculate out of time ordered correlators. And it is very easy to understand. I have some pictures in my later slides. So if you have a genuine OTO correlator, you will be able to see that you cannot insert all your, all your operators in the, I mean, for the particular kind of time ordering for OTOC on a one fold time contour. You really need to generalize it to higher time folds to be able to insert your uh, operators inside OTOC with the right kind of uh, time ordering. So uh, that way we understand that one fold time contour is not enough to define out of time ordered correlators and it has to be generalized uh, to higher fold time contours of uh, you know, path integral. So more precisely, OTO correlators of the particle, then that means that are not determined by parameters of the nonlinear Langevin equation because we got this nonlinear Langevin theory from the effective theory which was uh, obtained just from path integration over single time fold. So we de definitely need some more parameters which steer the OTO dynamics of the particle, so to say. So example of such an out of time ordered correlators uh, is this kind of a correlator where uh, there is a initial density matrix which is, uh, 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 which is inserted at an infinite past. So you see that there are two operators whose immediate neighbors will lie to their past. That means inside this correlator, time ordering violation is happening mm -hmm. twice not once. So this kind of a correlator you cannot define on one time fold contour because let's say you want to insert your operator on time fold. So uh, time, time is uh, let's say flowing in this direction. So increasing direction. So you insert your QT somewhere here then Q0 somewhere here. But then again, you have Q0 and QT. So you cannot really go back along the contour. So you have to really generalize your contour to another fold to de define such a correlator. So path integral representation, as we understand from picture, that's a, uh, in a path integral representation of such OTOCs will require a generalized contour with two time folds. So motivated from schwinger keldysh as we observed in one time fold contour that the microscopy had, uh, microscopic theory had to have two copies of degrees of freedom. Here we need four copies because uh, there will be some generalization of reduced density matrix as an initial state and you evolve forward backward four times. Uh, and uh, these four copies of uh, degrees of freedom will take care of that. So this is the, then the, you start with a microscopic theory with four copies of this original Lagrangian that I mentioned with this QXY coupling. And using a similar process as we did in one time fold contour, you can basically integrate out XY degrees of freedom once again, and write down the uh, effective Lagrangian uh, for the particle. So that Lagrangian, uh, the quadratic piece will just be generalized to have uh, four legs now, but the structure remains exactly same. But the interesting fact is that the quartic terms in this effective theory of the particle, like order Q power four terms, and all the first derivatives also, can now be split into two parts. One part will reduce to the quartic terms in schwinger keldysh effective theory under identification of degrees of freedom of any two successive legs. So you have now four legs, and you, uh, if you collapse any consecutive two legs, then the effective theory that you get back is the standard schwinger keldysh uh, one time fold uh, effective theory. But because of this twofold general, uh, two generalization of the contour, there is a genuinely new out of time ordered piece in the effective theory, which has many more new uh, effective couplings, total 13 effective couplings, four of them are non-derivative and nine of them are derivative effective couplings. By derivative, I mean the derivative terms, time, uh, time derivative terms. And uh, so gamma denotes those de derivative couplings. And then there are couplings with uh, tilde and without tilde. So tildes just mean that these are time reversal odd couplings and without tilde, they are just uh, time reversal uh, even couplings. 
So uh, we have written the effective theory in a form, in a manifestly, in a, in a form which has manifestly time reversal even and odd terms. So the this OTO part, which is I say the genuinely new term because of the generalization of the uh, second fold of the time contour, looks like this. I mean, it has many other terms, but I'm just trying to show you the structure here. So notice that if you collapse any two successive legs, which means that you either set Q1 plus Q2 equal to zero or Q2 plus Q3 equal to zero or Q3 plus Q4 equal to zero, which were four degrees of freedom on the four legs. So you collapse any two consecutive legs, then this is a this is multiplying the whole thing. So basically this whole OTO piece will just go to zero. So if you go from two time fold to one time fold by collapsing two consecutive legs, this OTO contribution to effective theory will completely disappear. So in one time fold control, you can't even see them. So you really need to generalize to more time folds and not just two. I mean, one can generalize to higher time folds and see um, contributions in the effective theory coming, coming from higher point OTO uh, sort of bath correlators in the effective theory, which has inside the correlation function, bath correlation function, you will have time ordering violation more than twice in that case. So this piece really vanishes, as I said, under collapse. So uh, uh, we have also written this genuinely new OTO couplings that have support in the second, because of the second fold generalization in terms of bath correlation functions. And those are there in, in our paper. But here I just quote those uh, uh, values of the integrals for the particular model that uh, we have. And notice that all the time reversal odd couplings with this tilde are actually zero because uh, we are dealing with harmonic oscillator system and which is time reversal invariant. So all the time reversal odd couplings are zero in this model. And also note that some of the OTO couplings in this model, these are the OTO couplings, are related to the schwinger keldish couplings or the nonlinear Langevin couplings in the model. So for example, kappa four gamma one will be related to zeta gamma and so on. So uh, we just, uh, at the level of the model, we see that some of these parameter values are similar, like uh, related by some factors. So we wonder whether there is a symmetry reason behind this. I mean, whether this is very specific to the model or this is in general true once we have this generalization of Kubo kind of formula, uh, like for effective couplings, we have some expression from Bath spectral function, whether there are some microscopic symmetries uh, that are constraining uh, various, uh, various effective couplings. So, uh, can I ask how much time I have? Um, so you have about 15 minutes. Um, okay. uh, but there are some questions. If, if, if you can take oh, questions. Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so uh, so let's start sequentially. So Srijit has a quick question. So maybe Srijit can ask. Uh... Yeah. OK. Hi, Vidisha. Uh, Hi. Uh, it's yeah. nice talk. Uh, so I was just wondering about uh, uh, the equation uh, that uh, probability distribution. Yeah. I mean, you have a nonlinear large bar equation. So mm -hmm. the linear large bar equation, uh, the probability distribution satisfies Fokker-Planck equation. So mm -hmm. is there any analog equation that this uh, probability distribution will satisfy? Yeah, that's a nice question. So actually, definitely, there will be a generalization of Fokker-Planck equation, which one can derive. I mean, we haven't done it yet, but uh, it's definitely true that uh, for a non-Gaussian probability distribution, there has to be a systematic, you know, calculation for generalization of Fokker-Planck equation. But uh, yeah, that is not yet done. And uh, a related question is that uh, uh, there are some uh, issues in uh, in the foundation of path integral of these stochastic uh, uh, equations, right? So mm -hmm. And some, I mean, in many cases, uh, the average of quadratic forms and the time average of the bilinear forms and the derivative, they don't commute of the quadratic forms. So like you, you get some uh, kind of uh, uh, ill-defined yeah, yeah. point. Ill that, that point about the, yeah, so basically you are trying to ask when I try to take a local limit there, I mean, I have to be very careful about the time ordering and exactly, I should. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that has been, uh, you know, when uh, we are uh, when we are writing this from the non-local effective action uh, to the local effective theory, I said uh, we had to take a derivative expansion sort of thing. There right. we actually took this Ito convention and we uh, did this kind of, uh, you know, this uh, split regulator, some epsilon, and uh, took care of this fact very uh, well. Okay, so okay, that, okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. So thanks. That, uh, but this is a very relevant point. Yes. But if you have Foucault-Planck type equation, then you can avoid this problem also. So if you go 
entirely to that description then these problems usually don't occur Yes. So actually, basically, our goal was to uh, calculate out of time ordered correlations of the particles. So from the effective theory framework. So and uh, also like from this out of time ordered correlations of the particle, you want to capture actually information about OTOCs of the bath just by you know information from the particle OTOC. So that's why we wrote a effective theory explicitly, which is which is not a Wilsonian effective theory, I must say. But yeah, this is a valid effective theory which will give rise to OTOCs of the particle. So that's why we uh, relied on this Hippocampus convention and so on. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So Ian has uh, some questions. Maybe you can take some of those questions also. Yes. Uh, uh, I think I can ask at the end of Bidisha's talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is also fine. Let me just uh, maybe proceed, and once I finish, then I will take questions. Uh, okay, so so far uh, we just uh, discussed uh, this much. So now I come to the symmetries. Like I was mentioning that your uh, Schwinger-Kildish effective couplings get related to OTO effective couplings for the particular model, but there might be some symmetry reasons behind it. So notice that the combined system and the bath has uh, microscopic time reversal invariance because it's just a harmonic bath. Hence, there exists an antilinear and anti-unitary time reversal operator T. Under which harmonic oscillators transform like this, and the O operator was just Q X Y. So O under time reversal uh, transformation will just become uh, O of minus T. So notice that because of this time reversal invariance in the microscopic theory, some of the out of time ordered correlators will be related to Schwinger Kildish correlators. So for example, if you start with this kind of a, so this is out of time or two, uh, this is a correlator. Which has time ordering violation inside it twice. So this is an operator whose both neighbors are passed to it, and also this is an operator who, who, who whose both neighbors are uh, lying to its past. So it has time ordering violation twice. So this is an OTO operator, uh, OTO correlator. But uh, if you perform time reversal transformation on top of this, this operator, uh, this correlator gets mapped to this correlator. Now look at this correlator. This is just a correlator which you can uh, define on a single time fold contour. So uh, these are two pictorial representations for these two correlators. So you start with this correlator, which has to be defined on two time folds. But under time reversal transformation, it maps to a correlator, which can be defined only on a single time fold. So we notice that uh, under microscopic time reversal invariance, some of the OTO correlators get related to correlators, uh, Schwinger-Kellish correlators, which are just correlators defined on a single time fold contour. Now, since the effective couplings, as I discussed, are expressed in terms of bath correlators. Hence, under microscopic time reversal invariance, definitely some OTO effective couplings will get related to Schwinger-Kildish effective couplings because uh, both of them are expressed in terms of bath correlation functions, and those bath correlators get related to each other under time reversal. And one such relation between uh, these OTO couplings and Schwinger-Kildish effective couplings are of this form. So, in the right hand side, you have OTO couplings, uh, and in the left hand side, you have nonlinear Landrin couplings. Uh, this thermal jitter in the damping and anharmonicity in the nonlinear Landrin equation. So under time reversal invariance, this relation holds true. And also there is another kind of symmetry because we are in a thermal state. So bath correlation functions are related to each other by Kubo-Martin-Schwinger relation, where uh, uh, some correlation function gets analytically continued, uh, uh, some correlation function gets related to its analytically continued version. So this C just means it's a connected uh, correlator. Uh, so this is the KMS relation and uh, note that uh, under KMS relation also that some of the OTO correlators get actually related to schwinger kildish correlators. And this observation was made uh, before in a paper uh, by these authors that uh, under KMS, OTO correlators get related to schwinger kildish correlators. And in our work, we have um, realized that, uh, again, since this uh, effective couplings can be expressed in terms of bath correlation functions, so under KMS also, some of the OTO effective couplings get related to schwinger kildish effective couplings. And if you work in the leading order in high temperature limit, then uh, this uh, you you under uh, KMS uh, you will see that uh, this holds true for large temperature uh, between dissipation and noise, and also uh, for the OTO effective coupling. So this kappa four gamma one was a OTO effective coupling, and zeta n was a non Gaussianity. So under KMS conditions, these two effective couplings get related to each other, which we call a OTO generalization of fluctuation dissipation relation. Now, since you have time reversal invariance and thermality both at hand, you can just combine them and you study uh, what happens at leading order in high temperature. So combining all these relations, so remember that this kappa 4 gamma 1 is related to zeta n. And you, if you go back to previous relation under time reversal, kappa 4 gamma 1 was also related to zeta gamma. 
and these terms actually drop at leading order in large temperature at leading order in la uh, large temperature it's a relation between kappa 4 gamma 1 and zeta zeta gamma so if you combine these two relations then you see that there is a direct relation between zeta n and zeta gamma so this is the generalization of fluctuation dissipation relation which is relating non gaussianity in the noise of the particle to the uh, thermal jitter in the damping constant of the particle and this factor uh, changes from uh, either you are studying cubic or quartic effective theory or higher orders but this is a very robust relation which is uh, true for at any order in the effective theory so i will summarize uh, uh, so we have constructed a quartic effective theory of a brownian particle which is coupled to a thermal bath and we have demonstrated that it is dual to a nonlinear langevin dynamics we have also shown that the effects from microscopic time reversal invariance and thermality uh, requires an out of time ordered extension of the effective theory because we saw that under these symmetries uh, schwinger keldysh correlators were related to otio correlators so unless you have a extension really from schwinger keldysh to two time poles you cannot uh, really study the effects of microscopic reversibility in a, and thermality in a genuine way so in this extended framework with two time poles we have identified the relations between effective couplings due to these features of the environment and these relations between effective couplings manifest in the form of otio generalizations of the fluctuation dissipation relation and uh, finally what we get is that uh, non gaussianity in the thermal noise gets related to the thermal jitter in the damping constant of the particle and also uh, i should i should say that uh, this uh, this generalized fdr between zeta n and zeta gamma is a much more general result because here in my entire talk the only assumption that i made was that in the microscopic theory was under control and the particle was weakly coupled to the bath and we wondered at a later stage whether this kind of a uh, generalization of fdr holds true for a strongly coupled system as well and uh, that's why we did in this work uh, with uh, logan agam and students at icts we actually uh, applied it to some holographic system so we considered a strongly coupled cft at the boundary and in the bulk we had ads and there was a probe string in the bulk and uh, we studied the uh, non linear uh, corrections to the brownian motion on a, of, of the quark in the cft and even there though the cft was a strongly coupled cft and we did a holographic computation to actually get any non linear langevin dynamics at the boundary we saw that still this result holds true for a strongly coupled system between zeta n and zeta gamma up to precise factors uh, for a quartic uh, effective theory at the boundary so uh, here is uh, there are many uh, interesting future directions from here but one interesting question is uh, our analysis clearly shows that the information about the evolution of the reduced density matrix of a generic system is not enough to determine its otiosis because reduced density matrix you start with reduced density matrix and you uh, you know the, if you do a schwinger keldysh path integral on one time fold you have a reduced density uh, i mean you start with a full density matrix and then you construct a reduced density matrix over one time fold but as you generalize your contour there has to be a generalization of the initial condition as well you have to generalize the uh density matrix uh, notion of dens density matrix also so can one generalize the notion of uh, reduced density matrix also uh, to some otio effective state of the particle is it also possible uh, to find appropriate generalizations of uh, entanglement entropy and other information theoretic quantities uh, in the context of uh, otio dynamics and of course uh, generalization of ruth akanagi formula for such quantities will be very interesting because uh we know that uh, this formula relates the entanglement entropy to some geometric quantities in the bulk so uh, if we can generalize the notion of entanglement entropy to take care of otio uh, otio dynamics then there has to be a generalization of rt formula in the bulk as well uh, which matches with this uh, so i will just uh, conclude thank you uh, thank you bidisha for the nice talk um so there is time for questions so uh first question is by ayan um so ayan you can start your questions yeah he has multiple questions actually well i think for the first question vidish already answered so i will ask the second question which is related to srijit's question um uh, so uh, in the case of the usual sk contour not the double folded one uh, you can go to 2pi formalism in which you have the schwinger dyson equations for the spectral and the statistical function right you mean the commutator and anti commutator mm -hmm. and if you write it in this way the equations are causal uh, they are like generalizations of the uh, fokker planck i would say uh, because uh, fokker planck is only the statistical function roughly 
uh, but in quantum theory, you will have both spectral and statistical, and they co-evolve. And these equations are causal, and people in quantum field theory have studied them. So in the case of this double-folded contour, uh, yeah. is there some sort of a causal formulation also, you would think, that would exist? Uh, by causal, you are meaning that uh, a generalization of Popper Planck equation. Uh, well, uh, I'm talking of the Schwinger Dyson. So essentially, if you could okay. uh, write it as a, uh, so the equation of motion for the yeah, Green's yeah. function, yeah, they become, they, they have a memory term, they are not local in time, but yes, they're still yes. causal. Yeah. So basically, I think that is possible. So once you have this non-local OTO effective theory at hand, which we have, so basically, you can just determine what is the equation of motion from there. So you have this uh, generalization of average difference degrees of freedom on four time four, uh, four legs of the schwinger kildish There will be two average and two difference degrees of freedom. And you can basically, if you just take uh, equa study equation of motion with respect to the difference degrees of freedom, you have two equations of motion for the, let's say, average degrees of freedom. And those will be some sort of uh, equivalent to schwinger dyson equations uh, for a quantum field theory. For a quantum theory, yeah. Yeah, it would be nice to see an explicit form where they're causal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it will be causal because, uh, yes. I mean, even if you uh, not take the local limit, I mean, if you have the full effective theory and you just write, uh, write down the equations of motion for this uh, average degrees of freedom, uh, I think, yeah, some of these questions can be answered. Yeah. Okay, so, but I have a disagreement with something you said, that the reduced density matrix is not enough. Uh, I think the point was, is that uh, obviously the 2PI effective action doesn't contain any new information that the one peer effective action doesn't have. It simply resums it in a different you, way, right? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Can you just explain what is this 2PI effective action? Yeah, the 2PI effective action is a generation of the 1PI effective action, where uh, in the 1PI you have only the one point function. In the 2PI you also have the two point function. They are treated as independent variables. Essentially, it's some sort of a resummation. It has no new information, but you can think of it like it's extrema gives you the equation of motion for the two pair for the two point functions. It's a nonlinear self consistent equation for the two point functions. And then you could take this, uh, then the two point function has two independent parts the commutator and the anti commutator. And yes. this is a spectral and statistical part. And then they have a causal evolution, but it's a very nonlinear, non trivial evolution. And this is something that people in quantum field theory community study. The renormalization of 2PI effective action is another story. It's very hard to understand it. I don't think it is, has been completely settled. The renormalization issues of 2PI effective action has some things, and I think your formalism will probably also have some renormalization issues, if I'm not uh, wrong. Uh, so these are, I think, still unsettled questions, but, but in certain cases, this has been used, uh, like in Lattice community have used it and have got magnificent results that they have been able to show thermalization, of ON models and they have beautiful results there. So I was thinking if you could uh, perhaps also understand the, the OTOC, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the thing in this kind of causal way, uh, one can probably also put it on a lattice or something and try to understand it. That's just my comments, yes. yeah. Yes, so I will just go back to the question that you asked, like uh, you, didn't, uh, you don't uh, agree, I mean, you made a comment that you don't agree with my comment that uh, there has to be a generalization of reduced density metrics for two time folds. So are you somehow trying to uh, say that if I work 2PI effective action somehow, it automatically takes care of all these causal uh, things. So then in that case, I really don't have to uh, look for a generalization of the reduced density metric, so to say. But um, I will be able to do all this auto computations from this 2PI effective theory. Is that what you are uh, saying? Well, I think my disagreement is more of semantics, you know. So what I would say that 2PI uh, effective action, you might say is a generalization of 1PI, right? But it yes. doesn't contain any new information as such. It is, it is simply a resummation of it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it, if you, if you, yeah, it's just a, re, a new way to kind of resum the secular terms, right? And this yeah. is something that, so in a way that is helpful of course, more practical and useful. 2PI is more useful than 1PI, but it still is not like a, something totally new or novel that mm -hmm. does not contain in the 1PI. So that's what, yeah. what I want, wanted to say. It's just a semantic disagreement. Yeah, yeah. So can you please also explain once more, sorry, like uh, maybe I'm not overshooting the time or I, I, am I? Um, no, no, actually there is time. Uh, there, there is time for some discussion. Yeah, yeah okay. So I will just uh, once again ask that, uh, so you are suggesting that there should not be uh, uh, in the 1PI, uh, let's say I can use also a different framework, but you are suggesting that uh, there, there, you don't have to really consider a generalization of reduced density metrics. So can you just explain that point once more? 
No, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you don't have to use a generalization of that because to like if you do it in like 2 pi version it is also a generalization yes because uh, you right? need but, some initial condition uh, for multi time folds so it will definitely be some you know direct product of uh, initial i mean it has to be a generalized uh, density matrix in that sense yeah yeah so all that i'm saying is that if you say that uh, it contains more information than the reduced density matrix i would kind of disagree because it's that it's not like it contains more new information the density matrix contains all the information that you need but is that uh, this kind of formulation helps you to kind of uh, study the time dependence in a more useful way. Just like 2PI effective action helps you to understand the evolution of correlation functions in a useful way. Uh, if you just a 1PI effective action will not be able to do that in a very useful way. Yeah. So I would the say that uh, yeah. that's all. The I think it's a semantic thing. Yeah. 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 Because I just want to emphasize on the, on this point that of course, like when you let's say when you integrate it, uh, integrate out microscopic uh, theories, degrees of freedom, bar degrees of freedom, and you write down the effective action. Uh, so of course, the effective action, the ge most general effective action should take care of all possible time orderings. But if you do this path integration over one time fold contour, starting from just a density matrix, and you construct the reduced density matrix just by one time fold contour, then that is not, you will not be able to see the effects coming from out of time ordered correlators of the bath. I, you, I agree with you. Yeah. I completely agree yeah. with you. I so completely agree sense, with you. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. But you would, I, I think that it's uh, it's not, but if you know all the two, uh, all the finger Keldish correlation functions, you should also, in principle, know the OTOX, right? I mean, it's just that it might be hard to get the information out, but you should be able to know them. Uh, you would agree with that because... Uh, uh, for thermal state, yeah, you can do some analytic continuation and so on. But for generic state, because finger Keldish, here we are discussing thermal state, let's say. But for a generic uh, for a scenario where you're, uh, let's say, I mean, you are in any arbitrary initial state and you don't have a good definition of analytic continuation, then given schwinger kellish correlators, and let's say you don't have access to time reversal invariance and all that for a generic setup and generic initial condition, and you don't even have a good definition of analytic continuation, then how will you, from schwinger kellish correlators, how will you get your OTOX? So that is not very clear to me. I don't Yeah, think I completely agree with you. We completely, if you're yeah. in a generic situation, you won't yeah. be able to you do that because you yeah. can't do analytic continuation. In a thermal equilibrium, of course, there should be a way to do it. But yes. all that I'm saying is that the out of time if evolution is anyway not a, is already uh, is something that if you if you know the two point function if you, if you, if you know the uh, already the uh, uh, yeah the information would be very hard to get because it's not so easy by analytic continuation. But even in the case of out of equilibrium uh, situation, uh, it's like saying that uh, the two two pi doesn't really have some new information than the one pi. It's just a must way of easy way to get it out. Uh, so I'm just saying that it, it's just simply a, a semantic disagreement, not really anything, anything profound or anything that, but the information should already be there in, in your density matrix already, right? Because density matrix is supposed to contain all the information. It's just that, uh, that because of, uh, able, uh, because you, 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 in you, certain you, scenarios, I agree that density you need to do very, but uh, in most generic scenario, I would just, uh, I mean, at least uh, the okay. way I say it is in most generic scenario, there has to be some sort of a generalization of state from, uh, you know, schwinger keldish uh, state to OTO state. Uh, and um, I mean, yeah, this is uh, how- Anyway, I, I think we can continue this on Slack. Okay. Yes, yes, that will be very interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, if there are, are there more questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Vidisha once again. Thank you. Okay, very good. So our next speaker is uh, is Matteo, and uh, he's here. So I asked him to uh, share his slides. And hi, everyone. Um, Hello. Do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, we see your screen, yeah. Okay. 
so so ayan what is the protocol shall we start or shall we wait sorry wait for what um are we 10 okay. minutes earlier we are we are we are 9 minutes earlier ah yeah we should wait a little bit we should yeah let's wait for 5 minutes or yeah let's yeah okay we can wait for 5 minutes yeah okay whenever you tell me i can start Much to show that he was at IIT Madras. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice photo, by the way. Yeah, it's a pity I cannot be this time again. Yeah, yeah. Come again, come. <laughs> How is the situation over there? <laughs> no idea. No idea. I mean, it's just we are all stuck at home, and nice uh, yeah, the case. Finally, we it took us very long for the number of cases to come down. And, So, I see. But we are still at number two now. But you guys are now. Europe is getting the second wave. I mean, yeah, Europe is getting worse as well. Uh, especially, well, at the beginning of the year, Madrid was getting quite bad. Now I think it's everywhere in Europe. The numbers are increasing, and uh, most of the countries do not want to close. So I don't know what's going to happen, but doesn't look very nice for the moment. Yeah, let me just get some water. I will be back in one minute.
ओके ओके मतियो वी कैन स्टार्ट नाउ Okay, here I am. You still see my screen, right? Yes, I see your screen. Do you see also my cursor or not? The Moving? cursor I see, the I I see the cursor but but because of the background color it is a bit difficult to spot. But from the next yeah. slide I think it will be it will be easy. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Over to you now. Uh, okay. Should I start now? Uh yes, please. You can start now. Okay so yeah let me start first of all to thanks the organizer uh, to organize such a nice event in uh, in these hard times it's nice to see familiar faces i would be happier to see him live but okay that's what we have so far and let's enjoy so um today okay so uh, my talk is based on a bunch of paper that uh, we did in collaboration with several people in the last years and uh, so the main topic uh, will be basically applied holography and in particular the role of translations and translations breaking in uh, bottom up holography and to be a bit more precise uh, there are three main themes that i i want like to discuss with you today so the first the first of them is basically what we call the holographic models with broken translations that i label for simplicity as holographic solid so the, the, there there has been a lot of uh, uh, let's say usage of this model and uh, the questions that i want really to you know uh, focus today is if we really understand them and what they are really mimicking and what is the role of homogeneity now uh, the dynamics of these uh, these models is pretty richer than the standard uh, let's say holographic models just because there is a new structure like this elastic structure and therefore there are new excitations uh, and you will see that there, there is a we can classify this excitation in basically two different setup and one set is basically the set of phonons which is more or less under control and understood but there are other excitations which are more let's say mysterious and i will try to show you what do we really see in this model and how can we understand this also from a field theory point of view and uh, finally uh, since this is applied holography i want to discuss a bit with you the physical consequences and uh, since the the thing that you will you hear you hear every time is strange metals i decide to focus on a different uh, applications which is uh, uh, as interest and the strange metal and uh, uh, it's much simpler to to understand So let me start with uh, some very basics uh, from Kenneth Mather. Uh, so what is a solid? So uh, a solid is just a structure which is rigid and uh, this rigidity is associated to a, a property of the system which is called elasticity. So the, the property of elasticity is really linked together with the existence of propagating waves uh, which are what we call the phonons. So you can see for example this is a picture of a solid and you can focus on a certain atom so this atom has an equilibrium position and it can oscillate around this equilibrium position so these oscillations are nothing else than basically low energy excitations which are indeed the phonons and from a theory from a theoretical point of view the phonons are the gauss and boson for translations so you can see a solid as a system that breaks spontaneously translational symmetry and the acoustic phonons to be more precise which are these atomic vibrations are nothing else that associated gaussian so here i make like a, a cartoon which is basically the, the 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 simplest cartoon ever so you can see that indeed at low momenta you have a propagating mode which is this acoustic phonon and the speed of this object is linked to the properties of elasticity of the system so more precisely the more rigid the system the faster this kind of modes now this is very well understood uh, under control and you can find it basically in chapter 1 of any solid state physics uh, book but now uh, when we move to holography uh, and precisely when we move to what they are called the homogeneous model new elements enter in the system so let me be first precise about what i mean by homogeneous models so there are specific systems that thanks to some additional symmetry they break translations 
but they preserve the homogeneity of the background geometry. So the stress tensor is homogeneous, even if the systems break translations. And I will show you in a moment uh, one case of this model. But before going there, I want to basically tell you what, the, what is the additional ingredient that actually allows this model to be homogeneous. So as we discussed, basically these models will break translations. So it's just basically a shift in the coordinate, let's say xi going to xi plus bi. And these space-time translations are associated to these goals and both on the phonons. And the phonons can be derived holographically using the standard, let's say, techniques of extracting poles of ring functions. So here you can see, for example, uh, one plot that is taken from this paper, which is already three years old, where we show that indeed in this model, once we break translations, there is an additional sound mode in the transfer sector, which is the phonon. Now, the point is that you are not only breaking the space-time translation, but you are also breaking an internal symmetry, an internal global symmetry. In the easiest case, this internal global symmetry is actually just a shift. So you can imagine like basically a scalar field that is just shifted by a constant. And what happened in this system is that these two symmetries are broken in a very specific way, which is they, they retain basically the diagonal group. So if I now set bi to b minus a high, basically the system is invariant under this combination even after the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, what is the meaning of this diagonal group? Well, the meaning of this diagonal group is exactly what we were discussing before, is to retain the homogeneity of the system. So the homogeneity is there because there is this diagonal group. And from a physical point of view, what is important, and it was already emphasized from the field, effective field theory point of view by Nicolis and collaborator, is that if you take a solid, imagine the table where uh, you are sitting, then let's imagine that you consider this table at length scale lambda, which is much larger than the microscopic scale. So this table or whatever solid will have, an, let's say a natural length scale, which is given by, if you want, the lattice spacing of this solid. And imagine that you're looking at, at this solid at scales much larger than that. So it's clear that in your table, your table looks like pretty homogeneous. And in order to retain this homogeneity at large scales, that's basically the additional symmetry that you have to impose. Now, what is the simplest example of these models is what is called uh, these axion-like models. So the idea, it's very simple. It's like you take a scalar and you basically promote let's say the solution for the scalar to be linearly dependent on the coordinate. So this is your choice. And you build uh, basically a, an action which is shift invariant under basically the scalar. So it will contain only derivative of the scalars. But you can see already that holographically the fact that you are imposing these solutions will break translations because now if I send xi to xi plus something, these solutions is clearly breaking that symmetry. And what I can do with that is that with opportune uh, actions or boundary conditions, I can basically set that these solutions implies a web for the dual field associated to the scalar. So basically what you will find out is that in the dual field theory, you will have an expectation value for an operator, which is space, domain, space dependent. This means that translation are spontaneously broken. And what you are doing is exactly implementing the spontaneous breaking of translations from the holographic point of view. Now, as I was saying, this, the theory wants, uh, we want the theory to be also invariant under this global shift to retain homogeneity. And therefore, basically what you will build is an action which is composed in terms of this tensor object, which is just at leading order two derivatives on the scalar field. And you can see two things which are very important. So the first thing that you see is that, of course, this action, whatever it is, the fine function of this IIJ, it will be shift invariant because it's basically only derivative term. And the other thing that you will see immediately is that whatever action you will construct, the stress tensor will always contain two derivatives of the scalar fields. This means that basically this profile will implement a constant term in the stress tensor. So the back reaction on the geometry is just a constant piece. And this is why the model and the system is simple and it will be still homogeneous. Now I will focus on this kind of system because they're the simplest systems. But there, is a, there are, let's say, other classes which are a little more complicated, but they follow exactly the same pattern. So the only difference is that the internal group is a bit more complicated. 
So I don't want to go into the details because basically the physics would be exactly analogous. It's just the level of the symmetry, there would be some complications. Now, there is already one puzzle, which I think it's pretty important. And uh, it's also quite relevant, uh, you know, in the discussions of, uh, of this conference, which is we know pretty well from the, let's say, the, the dictionary that once we play with holography, whenever we put a globe, a local symmetry in the bulk, this corresponds to the global version of the symmetry. Now here there is a big problem because as I told you before, we're putting in the bulk a symmetry which is global. And there are two problems. So the first big problem is understanding what this theoretically means. So if I put a global symmetry in the bulk, what is the dual? What is the dual manifestation of the symmetry? You could just say, well, you know, I believe in string theory in quantum gravity. There are no global symmetries. What are you talking about? That's a fair approach, but in the low energy regime, we know that global symmetry can emerge and can be there in nature. And therefore, I think it's, it's an interesting question to understand what is basically the dual formulations. And another important point is that since you are putting basically this symmetry to be global in the bulk, it's not guaranteed that what you are doing is the boundary is exactly the effective field theory of Nicolis and France, because in their effective field theory, this symmetry is global in the boundary. So in principle, in order to have exactly the, the dual, the gravitational dual, you should gauge the symmetries, all the symmetries, including the, the, the internal one. And that's what, what is done, for example, in this paper, but I, I would say is highly unexplored. Now, going to the physical consequences, uh, there is an important physical consequence, which is instead of obtaining only the phonons degrees of freedom that you understand very well, because they come from basically the breaking of translations, there is an additional mode in this system. Okay, and these additional modes uh, appears in the longitudinal spectrum and it's diffusive. Somebody likes to call it crystal diffusions for reason that we will see. And uh, so the big question is basically what is this mode? And uh, so first of all, where it come from? Second, uh, does it have a physical meaning and what it does represent? So what do we learn about these modes in the, in, in the last year? Well, the first thing that we learned, thanks to nice works by Donos and collaborator and Gutero and collaborator, is that these modes does not come from translation, but it, it comes from the spontaneous symmetry breaking of this global symmetry. And the other important thing is that this diffusive mode, it's very different from the diffusive mode that we are used to, because it does not come from a conserved current or a so what we are used for, let's think about, for example, shear diffusion or charge diffusion is whenever you have a current which is conserved, you write down your constitutive relation and what you find out is that it, there is an associate hydrodynamic mode, which is diffusive. Now, this mode is different. It's very different. And I will explain a bit better uh, why it's different in the, in the next slides. Now, there is another big puzzle, uh, which is uh, whenever we had a small source of explicit breaking, so we implement what is called the pseudo spontaneous limit and the phonons becomes massive uh, because they, they obey what is called the GM of R relations, which uh, it's basically what happened for pions in QCD. So you have a Goldstone boson and then you break also explicitly this symmetry uh, softly. And what you get is the mode that has a mass now and this mass, which here is called omega naught square, is basically proportional to the scale of explicit breaking times the scale of spontaneous breaking. And this happens. So this happens even in holography for this Goldstone boson. And it's not big surprise because it, it has to be. It just comes from symmetry arguments. Now, the more curious things is what happened to this diffusive mode that from now on I will call phasen. And uh, it will be clear in a while why. The, fa the phasen, instead of getting a mass, it becomes dumped. So you have this additional Goldstone mode, which is diffusive which when you break the symmetry explicitly become dumped with a dumping, which is called capital omega. Now, curiously, this capital of omega depends linearly on the explicit breaking. And it was found also by uh, the same authors that there is a sort of universal relations that basically uh, connect the diffusion constant of this crystal diffusion mode with its dumping and the mass of the, the phonons. So this is, a, again, a very universal. So I will show you that it's test in a, in a lot of models. And uh, it's a bit like mysterious, right? Just to follow the, the, the title of this conference. Now, what are the questions that I really want to address today? So are, are really precise questions. So the first question is, what is this diffusive mode? 
The second question that I want to address is what is this capital omega relaxation and where it does come from? The third question is I want to understand on solid base from field theory where this universal relationship come from and if it's actually universal or not. And then after we went through this kind of holographic you know, uh, walk, I want to show you actually if this is all real and what are practical applications. So where this kind of theory of what we learned, it can be actually useful for real life. Now, the first thing that uh, I have to mention is uh, a sort of a system which I find very fascinating, which are aperiodic crystals. So what we discussed so far in terms of solid, it's basically a crystal which is periodic. So you can imagine this colored square lattice and you can really see that this is periodic. So this is just a statement that whenever a solid break translations, it breaks it up to a subgroup, which is discrete, which defines basically a lattice spacing in the solid. Now, on the contrary, if you go to the complete opposite side, you can have systems which are completely amorphous. And so there is no shape, there is no lattice structure, they are totally disordered. And the typical system of this kind are glasses. Now, there is something in the middle, which is the following. What about if you have order, but the system is not periodic? So these systems do exist and goes under the name of quasi-crystals. So they got assigned a Nobel Prize for chemistry and they are actually exist, they exist in nature. And they're, they're typical, uh, let's say, uh, they are defined in a way that they have long range order. So exactly like crystals, but they do not have periodicity. So in other way, the translations are broken continuously down to, to no subgroups. And two typical examples that are discussed a lot. So one is basically the Penrose tilings, which appears in a lot of, for example, also of architecture, especially the Arab architecture. They are very nice, uh, you know, decorated and periodic uh, uh, tiling. And one other, uh, let's say, example, which is more relevant for, for example, the, the topic of strange metals or superconductivity, et cetera, are incommensurate charge density wave. Now, what is an incommensurate charge density wave? Well, the easiest way to understand this is that it's a system, let's say a solid system, where you have two periodic structures with a different wave vector. So let's imagine, for example, to have a crystal where the crystal structure is represented by these orange, let's say, uh, high ends, orange balls. And let's think that for a certain reason, basically the charge density wants to uh, form on top of this an additional structure, which is modulated but it's modulated with a different uh, phase with respect to the sub, let's say, lattice. So the typical example, if I call the, the momentum of the sub lattice K is basically a structure of this form where you can see that there is clearly the charge density oscillating with, but with a phase. And this phase can depend on the position. So this phase takes into account that there is incommensuration between the two. So that there's no phase lock-in between the two structures, okay? And there are two very important points. So the first important point is that if you write the free energy of these systems, you realize that basically this is invariant under the phase shift, which means that basically a relative shift between the two structures is basically not producing, it does not cost any energy. And this corresponds to basically an hydrodynamic mode, which is you take your structure on top and you shift it a bit left and right. Okay, so these modes, left and right, is basically phasing because it's basically the mode associated to the phase and is in contrast to the other mode, which is called the amplitude, amplitude on, which is basically just, you know, the variation of the amplitude. So, you, of course, you're very familiar to this kind of mode if you do particle physics. The amplitude on is nothing else than what we call the X mode and the phase on is nothing else than what we call the Goldstone mode usually. And as you know, the Goldstone mode is massless, right? So the phase on is massless, is an hydrodynamic mode, while the amplitude is not is not. This means that from effective field theory point of view, the amplitude can be integrated out at low energy, but the phasing must be uh, kept. Now, these phasons are real, so you can really measure them. And uh, it's a new hydrodynamic low energy excitation. So here you see, for example, two plots, which are taken by uh, some experimental paper. So here what you can see is that tau, so the relaxation time, the, the lifetime of this particle, uh, goes like uh, one over Q square. And you can see that basically this behavior, so the relaxation time being the inverse of Q square 
is exactly diffusive behavior. Because remember that the relaxation time is the inverse of what we call attenuation, or if you want, dumping rate. And the Q rate, which goes like Q squared, is exactly diffusive. And you can see that the, the data are, are quite in agreement with this diffusive behavior. And therefore, it's widely accepted that at low energy and at low momenta, this kind of mode is diffusive. Now, there is another way, a bit more complicated, to understand uh, why this guy is diffusive and what is actually this, uh, uh, this excitation, which is the following. So there is a mathematical theorem, which I find uh, very fascinating, which states the following. So take an aperiodic system. And the statement is that you can always see an aperiodic system as a periodic system living in one dimension more, cutted at an irrational angle. So this procedure is usually called a, a cut procedure. And here is, I, I, make a, I made a cartoon in two dimensions. So let, let's see what, what is exactly happening here. So focus on the blue balls, okay? So if you focus on the blue balls, what you will see is that this is nothing else than a two-dimensional square lattice, right? The simplest crystal structure that you can imagine. And now what you do is you do a cut. So you draw a line that cuts this two-dimensional structure into a one-dimensional one. Okay, so this one-dimensional structure would be your real physical dimension. Now, what you can convince yourself pretty easily is that if you cut an angle, which is rational, the structure, once you project it on the one dimensional line, it will be still periodic with a different period because of course you're projecting with a angle, but it will be still periodic. On the contrary, if you project with an angle, which is irrational, you will find out that the system that you get is not periodic. So you are breaking periodicities. And you can convince yourself that it will be basically composed by a, a, a combination. So a list of basically small and long segment, which are not periodic. So if you follow this small and long segment, at a certain point, you will see that there are some points where basically there is a defect. There is something missing. So the, the structure is not periodic. And if you see, for example, in the example that I draw here, you can see that it follows, for example, this, this list. At a certain point, instead of being two long segments, there are three. So this means that these things is not periodic. Now, how do you see the phasen from here? Where the phasen from here, you see that you have two additional, two kind of symmetries. You have one symmetry, which is basically the orange point oscillating around the equilibrium position in real space, which now is one dimensional. But you have an additional freedom, which is in principle, I can shift this cut up and down, retaining the same angle. And this will not change anything of the projection, right? Because I'm not changing anything about the projection. But something will happen. So if you do these, these things, you will see that actually some of the orange point will rearrange. So in, in particular, you can have a situation where from LS sequence, you will jump to an SL sequence. So you can see, for example, here that at a certain point, you know, a long sequence will become a small sequence and vice versa. So it's here in the circle. And from the real space, what this means? Well, it means that basically you are rearranging the points. So this is not an oscillation around equilibrium like a phonon. This is basically a rearrangement. And as a rearrangement, of course, you have to imagine that you have a potential barrier, right? Because moving the place from, let's say, the atom from their equilibrium position to another costs energy. You have to overcome a barrier. And indeed, these things is possible only if you have finite temperature. So you need a certain amount of energy. So what we learn here is that basically phasons are nothing else than jumps or rearrangements, atomic rearrangements. And they're very different from atomic vibrations, which are phonons. So this is the, basically the practical difference. So the, the theoretical difference is that one is a shift in space time, and the other is a shift in internal space, if you like, in the phase space. And from physical point of view, one is a vibration around an equilibrium position, and the other is a rearrangement. So let's, let's see a bit the, the first summary of the questions. So phasons do not come from a conserved quantity. So phasons are actually diffusive Gaussian modes. And these are very funny objects as well, because usually we're not, uh, let's say, used to diffusive Gaussian mode. We usually talk about propagating Gaussian mode. And uh, EFT explains them. So we recently have a, had a paper with Michael uh, where we explain this, and I will go through it in a while. Now, the other things which is very corroborated is that phasons are not related to space-time symmetries. 
And the final thing is that all the holographic homogeneous models share these features. So it's not just a simple model that I show you. There are many more, more complicated, more realistic, that share exactly the same features. Now, one important question that you know, uh, one should address is how much is important to have this homogeneity? Okay, so you can have systems where basically, you know, a real crystal is clearly inhomogeneous. And you can ask yourself, well, does it really matter if it's homogeneous or not? And this is, of course, a question that, you know, you, 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 are, you, you listen every time when you give this kind of talk. And it, it's definitely important. And that's why very recently with, uh, with some friends, we tried to basically check this, uh, this problem in a real inhomogeneous lattice. So what do you do? Well, instead of playing with these simple homogeneous uh, models, you do something a bit more complicated. You create an instability of your holographic theory towards a phase which wants to become inhomogeneous. Okay, so this is well known. It started a long time ago, uh, and it goes usually under the name of charge density waves. And uh, the, the idea is very simple. You have basically a, a holographic configuration or a gravitational configuration, which at a certain energy, and at a certain temperature and at a certain momentum becomes unstable towards the formation of this inhomogeneous structure. And the typical plot that you see is basically this kind of bell curves, which indicates basically at every temperature and momentum where, uh, what is the structure that the, the model wants to form. And of course, what you can do, you can construct numerically. So now you get PDEs, it's a bit more complicated, but if you are strong enough, you can do it. And you can really follow these instabilities. And what you really see is that basically the profile of, for example, here I, I, I pictured the current and the, and the scalar, they become really inhomogeneous. So you will really see some kind of nonlinear inhomogeneous structures that is created on top of basically your holographic configuration. And then what you can do is you can really go there and check uh, what happened to these modes if you are in this inhomogeneous configuration. So the first question that we try to address is, is this mode that we see really there and uh, or is just an artifact of homogeneity? So what you see here is basically in this cartoon on the left, you see basically the structure of the modes uh, going down in temperature. So there is a critical temperature here around 0, 1, 5, 1 something, which we call TC. So above this uh, temperature, translations are not broken spontaneously, but are only softly broken explicitly. Below, they are both broken spontaneously and a little explicitly. So let, let's see first on the right side. So on the right side, you see one blue mode, which is imaginary and is slightly damped. This mode is the mode that drew the pole. So this takes into account that momentum is dissipated and the rate, so you will see that the, basically the imaginary part of this mode determines how much you are breaking explicitly the symmetry. Then there are other two modes, which are kind of parallel to each other. And you can see that one of them, the green one, actually goes to zero at critical temperature. So this is the mode that actually drives the instability. Because you see that exactly at TC, he wants to get a positive imaginary part, which means explosion. And then there is a second mode which basically is a secondary instability. And you can really see that these two modes correspond to basically the real and the imaginary part of this uh, condensate, if you like, or if you like, at the amplitude fluctuations and the phase fluctuations. Now, what you see is that when you go below the critical temperature in the broken phase, things start basically to uh, interact together and you get a picture which is exactly in agreement with the aerodynamic prediction of Arnold's collaborator and is exactly the same one that we see in the, you know, the, in the homogeneous model. So this means that, of course, in the, in the homogeneous model, you don't have access to this instability because there's no basically no homogeneous instability. But below, once you are in the broken phase, the system is exactly the same, whether it's homogeneous or inhomogeneous. Of course, we have to be careful because when I say it's exactly the same, what I mean is that the low energy spectrum, so the hydrodynamic spectrum is the same. Of course, if you go at high enough energy, momentum or frequency, you will see these homogeneities. So I'm not claiming that the models are the same. I'm claiming that the hydrodynamic low energy dynamics contains exactly the same excitation. And one thing that you can check, which is also interesting, is that even in the systems, this phase relaxation, capital omega, is linear in the explicit breaking, like in the simplest system. 
So this is a nice check. So for the moment, what we get is exactly the same of the homogeneous models. And now what you can see is also what I was telling you, you can understand this a bit better and you can start to basically increase explicit breaking. And what you see is the following. So what you see is that, so if the explicit breaking grows, first of all, the Drew de Paul becomes more and more damped, the blue. And there is also a very uh, important other consideration that I will focus in the, in the next slide, which is the following. So A is basically the amount of explicit breaking. And what you can see is that A is the responsible for basically splitting these instabilities mode, leading and subleading. And the more you put A, the more you are splitting this instability. Okay, so of course, if you put A too large, at a certain point, you go in the regimes where the goldstone does not make any sense anymore, and you lost completely the second mode. So at a certain point, if you go to very high A, hey, basically you can forget about the second mode because this second mode will disappear at, uh, at basically high frequency. So now this is a nice story, but there is even a nicer story, which is that we can understand this, uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, collective game from a very simple field theory, which is called uh, the theory of pattern formation, which is basically a, a, an improvement of Landau, Gizmund Landau theory. So this theory of pattern formation is used a lot to study basically the, the formations of inhomogeneous structures in, in several phases of matter. And it's very simple. So the idea is basically to, to write down a free energy like in Landau formalis, and basically to write down a dynamical equation which tells you that basically the variation of, uh, let's say, the dynamics, the time dynamics of this Goldstone mode is basically related to this kind of free energy action that you put. So this free energy action that you put is something very simple that you know since, you know, ages. So these two new first terms are nothing else than the double well potential, the typical double well potential for uh, spontaneous breaking. And then there is an additional term which is important, which is basically this F term. So this F term implements basically the breaking of the, this phase shift, right? Because you can see that now it depends only basically on, on this uh, phi star and it's linear and uh, therefore uh, it's not invariant. So basically then what you can do is very simple. You can study this equation in the broken phase and in the, and in the normal phase. So you can really see that uh, there are two solutions to this equation as always in the double world potential. There is one which is basically the trivial solution zero and the other one, which is basically the typical one, the square root of uh, A divided alpha divided B or whatever it is. And then what you can do, you can basically do small perturbation around these two solutions and see which are the modes that you get. So let's see what do you get. So the first important thing is like, let's consider for a moment that F is zero. So I'm in the purely spontaneous symmetry breaking picture. So what you see here is that there are a mode which now is going basically to zero when alpha goes to zero. Remember that alpha in the Gisborne Landau theory is proportional to T minus Tc. So basically when alpha goes to zero, this is exactly the critical temperature. And then you see that basically these modes goes to zero. So these modes are together now if F is zero and they go to zero and they produce the instability. And then when you are in the broken phase, you will see that basically there is one mode. Remember that now alpha becomes negative because now you are below Tc. So there is a mode that relaxes. And there is another mode, which is basically for F equals zero, this is constant. So this means that does not relax. So what is this mode? Well, this mode is the Golson mode. Okay, so this is the Golson mode in the broken phase that appears and that is, does not relax because of course you are not breaking the symmetry. So the Golson will be there forever. It's an aerodynamic mode. Now, when you do the explicit breaking on top, what you see is that, first of all, the critical temperature is shift. So it's not just alpha equals zero, but it's actually al alpha equal F. So it's exactly when this mode wants to go to zero. The other mode will remain damped at exactly the critical temperature, and both the modes below will be damped. So what you will find out now is that the goal is not infinitely living, but it has a finite lifetime. And of course, this is obvious from a physical reason because basically you are breaking the symmetry. So you are, the Goldstone cannot be there forever. It's not protected anymore by the symmetry. So let's see, the summary of, uh, of let's say question two is that, so the low energy physics of the broken phase is perfectly captured by the homogeneous model and by aerodynamics. 
So this means that at this stage, there is no difference between homogeneous and inhomogeneous, and there is no reason to believe that the homogeneous assumptions, which at the beginning was just a simplification, has any role in what we're seeing here. Now, the other things which are important is that this phase relaxation splits basically the amplitude and the phase fluctuations above TC. And the nice thing is that basically this time dependent Landau equation is able to explain the complete full dynamics across this phase transition. So it's pretty nice to have a, you know, a clear understanding of what's going on. And uh, one thing that I don't have time, but of course, this, this kind of uh, dance of modes has an implications on, on transport. And uh, there are features which, of course, appear, especially in the conductivity, uh, which are basically uh, given by these things. In particular, what you will find out is that there is a metal insulator transition at TC. And this is very different from what happened basically in, in, uh, in standard gapped charge density wave, let's say, uh, where basically this uh, metal insulator transition is exponential because here is power law. And one can understand very well why it's power law, just following basically what I told you. Now, uh, the last thing I want to discuss a bit is basically uh, what is phase relaxation, okay? So this is a word which is uh, I used a lot and uh, where it appears. Well, where it appears, it appears basically from uh, in, in all these kind of systems where you're breaking spontaneous asymmetry, so you have some kind of order and the order is basically related to the coherence of this Golson mode. But for certain reason, basically this coherence is broken. So the Golson mode, uh, somehow uh, relax and the order gets destroyed. So there are two typical examples where this happens. So the first example are vortices. So vortices, for example, in superconductors, that's exactly what they do, right? We know that vortices induced by a magnetic field, they destroy the superconductor and they destroy exactly in a way that they create basically relaxation for the goals. So the goals are relaxes and you break superconductivity. The same happen in solids when you introduce dislocation. So dislocations are basically defects in the crystal structure of the system that they can proliferate around and they can melt the solid. So basically you destroy the order of the solid because of this dislocation. One important thing is that this phase relaxation, at least in these terms, is not a feature due to explicit breaking. So on the contrary, what I just told you, and uh, I emphasize again now, in this holographic model, what we find out is that basically this phase relaxation is a feature of explicit breaking. It appears exactly in the same way as phase relaxation should appear, but is proportional to the explicit breaking. Plus, and this can be seen very sim simply from this universal relation that I mentioned before, because you know that the mass of the phonon is proportional itself to the explicit breaking. So basically from this relation, you see that also capital Omega has to be. And uh, there is one big question, which is also quite tricky, which is real phase relaxation should basically create a through the pole in the frequency dependent viscosity, but we don't see it. So in holography, there is no way to see this through the pole. So this suggests that even if it looks very, very similar to phase relaxation, there is something more or something different that uh, uh, I think it's fair to say that it's not understood yet totally. Now, one last thing that I, I want to show you before going to a short application and conclude is how you can kind of understand uh, these, uh, these relations from, uh, from EFT. Okay, so from, from effective field theory, uh, what you can do is the following. So first of all, it, it's a bit more complicated than standard effective field theory, because as I told you, you need temperature and you need dissipation. Otherwise you won't see this mode. And therefore what you have to use is basically these uh, caldi schwinger techniques where the action is non-remission. And so in order to understand basically where these, uh, these new modes comes in, you have, you have to introduce some new fields, which here I call Psi, which are basically taking care of the internal direction. So these fields are associated to the internal direction and they have a shift symmetry, okay? And what you can see here is that there is a, sh a shift symmetry in this four direction, which is basically the phase, okay? So you have to understand the psi four as basically a shift in the phase. And now when you write down your effective field theory, not only you have to write down basically the phone on degrees of freedom, which corresponds to basically the real space-time translation, which is what I call X mu, but also the psi field. 
And then you follow basically the Kaldish finger, let's say technique. So basically what you have to do, you have to double your fields content. You have, and it's very convenient to go in a base where basically you, you write down what is called the classical field and uh, what is called the quantum fluctuations. And then what you can do, you can really write down your action. And you can see that it, it, very interesting, you can write terms which are you know, imaginary. And then what you can do, well, you follow the rule of EFT and the simplest way to see how to recover these dynamics is the following. You can, you can think of basically decoupling this Psi 4 mode from the rest and going at the coupling limit where you are exciting only the Psi to the 4 mode. And what you find out is that this Psi to the 4 mode, instead of being propagating, which would be what you will find out if gamma is zero, it has these weird dispersion relations. And if you check what is the solution of this dispersion relation on small momenta, you will find that it's diffusive. And funny enough, this diffusion is due to this kind of dumping terms, which come from M44. And if we go back to M44, you can see that these terms is a terms that you can build only at finite temperature. So if you go at zero temperature, these terms, you cannot write it. And there's no way you can have diffusion, OK? These other terms is proportional to what is called usually the phase on elastic modulus, which is nothing else than basically a, a standard component, a standard basically term in the, in the action. So, so basically, this is something very funny. So what happened is that in systems which are non-hermitian, you can have uh, basically uh, modes, which even if there are a symmetry of the system, they contain the terms which looks like a dumping. So this dumping terms does not come from an explicit symmetry breaking. So if you see this action here, this symmetry action is completely invariant under phase shift. And the reason why is that the A field that you see here is a difference between fields one and field two. So whenever you shift these fields, basically the phi har A field will transform, but the phi A A will not transform. And that's exactly why in the action, no terms with phi r will appear because otherwise you will break the symmetry explicitly. But terms with phi A can appear even with terms which are not derivatives. Okay, so this is a particular feature of this Kaldish finger, uh, let's say EFT. Now, and now you can understand immediately that if you want to break the symmetry explicitly, what you have to do, you have to add to this action terms which are proportional to the R fields. Because the R fields now are sum of fields and therefore when you shift them, they shift as well. So if I put now a term in the action, which is not derivative in this guy, this is clearly not invariant under this shift. And that's exactly what you can do. So what you can do, you can start adding terms in this action, which are basically uh, in terms of R field. And there are two types of terms that you can put. One is basically a kind of mass terms. And another one is basically a terms which it contains also a first derivative in time, at least a leading order. So these are the leading order terms that you can put. But then you want to do something different because as I told you at the beginning, basically this holographic model, they break the symmetry, but they break it in a way that basically retain the diagonal symmetry. And you remember the diagonal symmetry, basically this X shift with space-time translation, while this Psi shift with internal translations. If you want to retain the symmetry, it's obvious that you have basically to combine these fields in a way that once you shift one and the other together, the terms are invariant still. So the only thing that you can do is basically imposing that these coefficients in front are actually the same and write down the terms like this. So this is, of course, not the most general thing that you can do, but this is what is relevant for basically comparing with these holographic models. Now, what you do when you do these kind of things, you can follow again and basically do uh, go to Fourier space, solve your equation of motion and get basically the mode. And what you find out is something very simple. Well, you find out that the phonon is basically now dumped by this omega zero and massive because you get a mass. And this is obvious because you can see that here, this is basically a mass term and the other is basically a dumping term. So this is kind of obvious. The less obvious things is that when you do the same for the phase and what you find out is that your equation is modified in this way. So basically what happened is that this was already there. This was already there, but you get now a mass term. But because this mode in at the beginning was not propagating but diffusive, once you expand this equation at low momenta, you will not find a massive mode. You will find the mode which is dumped. And if you do the concrete computation, you will find out that this dumping that I call capital omega is exactly omega zero squared divided comma bar. This is just solving this equation. 
So then when you put inside a, and you basically reshuffle a bit these coefficients in terms of uh, the diffusion constant, et cetera, not surprisingly, what you get is that this capital omega follow exactly the rule that was observed in holography by Guterro, Donos, and friends. So what, what, I, what I'm saying here is that these mysterious universal things that you find in holography is actually not mysterious. And it comes explicitly uh, from uh, the symmetry breaking pattern. So it's not a feature of holography, it's just a feature of the concrete symmetry breaking pattern that you are doing. And I think it's very nice that you can understand this from the EFT point of view, and, uh, and that holography, of course, agrees with that, which is kind of obvious because this depends only on the symmetry, not on the system, on the microscopies you're doing. Now, uh, before finishing, I want to mention one thing, which uh, I think is pretty interesting. Uh, so, of course, the, the main interest about this system with broken translations, phase and char density wave, etc., is for uh, these strange metal phases, coup rates, ITC superconductivity, etc. But since I, I don't want to bore you again with this, because you probably heard it thousands of times, and every condensed matter applied holography paper has this phase diagram there. I want to give you another application, which I think it's nice as well, and it's very simple to understand, uh, which is the following. So, so this here, it's a plot that I took from uh, this paper. So this paper is a PRL paper. And what they do is they take basically an incommensurate crystal. So an incommensurate crystal is again exactly what I was telling you before. It's a crystal where there are two structures which are not in phase. Okay, so this means that in the, the, the physics, the kind of physics that we're discussing is actually exactly at work there. And what you find out here, let's see what they do is the following. So what they find out is here, what you see is they plot the specific heat divided T cube. Okay, why they plot the specific heat divided T cube? Because if you take a standard solid, you will learn immediately that basically the specific heat in a solid goes like T cube. This is the by law. And now here, let's see what they see. So they see something very different. So they see, basically, you see the Debye contribution, which is what you would expect in a solid, you will get a constant. And then it will drop down because basically you are reaching basically the cutoff of the theory. So here you are, you are reaching the boundary of the brilliant zones. But what you can see is that the data, the experimental data in this, kind, in this paper are very different. So first of all, you can see that there is a divergence. And this divergence is actually one over T square, if you feel it. And then there is a bump. Okay, and what you can see even more, what these people say is that actually you can distinguish the contribution from the phason and the amplitude, amplitude on. And what you see is that the phason is responsive, responsible for this divergence at low temperature. And the amplitude is the responsible for basically this bump after. And so one thing which is very nice that we did together with uh, uh, my condensed matter colleague in uh, 2019 is basically, uh, to try to understand why is that. And you can really convince yourself that in this kind of system, uh, where there is a phason, you will get a, a contribution which is proportional to basically the, the phason diffusion constant, the phason dumping and the phason diffusion constant, which is linear in T. So this means that whenever in a system you have a, a phason mode or in general a diffusive mode, in addition to your phonons, you will get a new contribution here which is linear in T, which looks like very similar to what is observing glasses, by the way. So this is the typical anomaly, which is discussing glasses where it's solved through the so-called two-level state. And so what we wrote analytically is very simple. Uh, you can see the paper is that basically uh, diffusive mode always contribute with a contribute, which is linear in T. And on the contrary, if you add mode, which are massive, because remember that the amplitude is massive, you will find the bump, which is more or less localized at the mass of this mode. And on the contrary, the constant part in the middle is the one given by the standard form. So if you basically remove the phason and the amplitude, you will just get basically a constant line like they show here. So this is a nice application in the sense that, you know, all these modes that we're discussing, where they come from, are physical. Not only they are physical, they have consequences. So they appear in transport, and I guess that they have many more uh, applications. So we start from this kind of questions, right? What is this diffusive mode? Where does omega come from? What is this universal relationship? And uh, can we understand something about, you know, applying this to real world? And uh, well, I, I hope I, I convince yourself today that, you know, what is the phason? The phason is a diffusive Golson boson. 
which comes from the spontaneous breaking of these internal shifts, which are real shifts, are shifts that appear in certain materials, is not an artifact of homo homogeneity. So it comes from this subleading instability, which are basically the fluctuations of the phase. And uh, nicely, it's not only you know, discussed, discussed in holography, but it can be derived in EFT. And it comes from this specific intertwined breaking. And it has to do a lot from physical point of view with the low temperature thermodynamic anomalies in, in, in materials. So every time you have this kind of materials, you have to be careful because new features can appear, of course, because you have a low energy modes moving around. And uh, to conclude, uh, so I want just to uh, throw there some ideas related to what is happening here. So there is an interesting question, which is basically there is the possibility, and there were recent paper in Nature where this happens, that the phonons become hydrodynamics. So this means that the, the interaction between the phonons due to anharmonicities are so strong in this material that basically the, the phonons are not any more individual quasi-particles, but they create basically a collective strongly coupled things moving around. And since it becomes like a fluid, then what you see is a second sound, like in superfluid. And this is observed in system with very high anharmonicity. So it would be very nice to understand this from, from point of view of symmetries. So what does this mean from the point of view of symmetry and what is the requirement to a second sound, both in holography and in EFT. Then another topic which is very interesting that uh, very, uh, so a few years ago, it was the observed for the first time superconductivity in these structure which are non-periodic in quasi-crystals. And there is a big question, which is of course, what is the role of this phase in superconductivity? So can it enhance superconductivity? Can it destroy? Can you have a pairing, which for example, is not mediated by phonon, but is mediated by this phase. And that's something that we are we're working on. And then, of course, you can ask uh, the question uh, about this phase relaxation. So uh, what is the difference with the real phase relaxation? And can you really implement the real phase relaxation, the one in, in, induced by defects? And, and of course, the final question, which is a bit more theoretical, is uh, what is the difference between basically this phase relaxation and this the pseudo spontaneous breaking that I, I discussed in this talk? And this is basically boils down to the question of what happened to certain quantities like the frequency dependent viscosity. And uh, well, this is work in progress and I hope I will have the occasion to you know, report on this maybe next year, maybe in person in India. And yeah, I want just to thank you for listening and uh, I'm ready for any questions you have. Okay, thank you, Matteo, for the nice talk. So let's thank Matteo. Thanks to you. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, Ayan has a few questions, so maybe he can take over and he can ask them. Yeah, there is time. Hey, Matteo, you are always welcome to India anytime, especially yeah, to yeah. Chennai. <laughs> especially to Chennai. Yeah. So uh, yeah, actually, I had a kind of a comment uh, come question is. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, that the effective filter is able to reproduce this results of EFT, maybe mm -hmm. that the membrane paradigm somehow uh, is directly reproducing the EFT somehow. Um. Yeah, so, uh, well, I believe that more than mem membrane paradigm is really like you are implementing some, uh, you know, symmetry breaking pattern. And uh, whenever you do the, the proper EFT formulations, whatever you get, is depending only on the symmetries. So I think it's a kind of guaranteed that once you find the correct descriptions in terms of EFT, you will get the same result. So uh, I'm not sure yet exactly what you mean by the membrane well, paradigm use the EFT. Well, the membrane paradigm is a similar uh, similar spirit like in EFT, right? You just, uh, uh, you don't care about what is happening in the full geometry. You just write an effective uh, fluid on the horizon. So it is similar to EFT in that sense. Uh, uh, so I don't know whether, uh, uh, maybe it is, uh, uh, I think even Gauntlet and Donos yeah, would be claiming yeah. something like a membrane paradigm is a reason why simplification. Yeah, so I see now your point. So indeed there are papers by Gauntlet and Donos discussing basically uh, what happened in these models in terms of the fluid description at the horizon. And what you can find is that indeed the fluid description at the horizon knows about all these things at the boundary. So you can extract, for example, DC coefficients, uh, modes, uh, and all these things, just looking at the fluid dynamic at the horizon. What is not uh, totally understood as far as I remember is that it's not clear what is this fluid description at the horizon. 
because it's different in principle from the, let's say, the, the standard uh, the boundary description. So, but it's true that there is a fluid description at the horizon that can describe all these kind of properties. So yes, it, what you are saying is true. You can reproduce the result. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a deep meaning. So if there is an understanding of what is really this kind of fluid theory at the, at the horizon and uh, what does it mean physically? Yes, and uh, the other comment is that I don't think this result has been proved to all generality. There will be a membrane paradigm always. Uh, so, for example, if you have hyper scaling violation, I'm not sure if uh, there is a proof in that case. So I think it is still, it could be that in some class of theories, uh, holography will be able to reproduce some results that you cannot get from EFT. Uh, perhaps if this, uh, if this is true. Yeah. Uh, that I, I would be surprised, honestly, because I, I believe that, uh, you know, at least the structure of the modes and uh, the kind of low energy dynamics, if you consider the correct EFT at finite temperature, I don't see why holography should get something different in general. I mean, of course, holography will know more because it will tell you the value of the coefficients and more things, but the structure of the low energy dynamics, I don't see how we can disagree, honestly. But yeah, so in, in this regard, I think I, re I, was I read a very nice paper, which I want to point out. It is, uh, uh, I just looked it in the chat box. It's a paper by Andrew Lucas, uh, where they studied, I think, uh, gauging of higher form symmetries, like dipole symmetries in the bulk. And that would apply even for hyperscaling violation. I think the claim, if I understand correctly, that in principle, uh, even if you try, you cannot even easily construct such an EFT. Uh, and in this case, holography could be is probably the only tool in market <laughs> to even construct such an EFT. And also in this case, it's not quite clear there is a membrane paradigm at all. So I yeah. think I just pointed out, I think this paper. So there are maybe yeah, many I, cases where uh, it is, uh, it, 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 uh, it, holography could be useful also. Yeah. So I, I know the paper. So what they do is basically they consider these, uh, these kind of modes that are the symmetries that appear in fractons. So basically what you have is that you have what they're called these tensor gauge symmetries, where instead of conserving only the charge, you conserve higher, more, higher, uh, um, higher, object, higher order objects, like, like you're saying, like the dipole or things like that. And then when you do that dynamic theory, instead of finding basically standard diffusion, you will find something like anomalous diffusion. So basically it's, it can be sub diffusion, super diffusion, but something faster than let's say uh, the standard diffusion. And uh, I, I'm not sure, I know there is a lot of work right now on these kind of things from the EFT point of view. I'm not sure how you can implement it, but this is a good question. So in principle, I guess with the techniques that we use with Michael, you can be able, I think, to write down the symmetries because the only thing that you have to understand is how to implement these symmetries, which are not really standard symmetries, are a bit more complicated. But uh, I know, for example, that there is a lot of work by, you will have a talk actually in, the, in this workshop by Cyber, right? Where he does the field theory for these fractons. Those are exactly the field theory related to this paper. The only difference is that the Cyber field theories uh, are written at zero temperature, while in order to see these subdiffusion modes, you need finite temperature. So it's always the same story that holography basically, it's very helpful when you do finite temperature, because as I show you doing effective field theory at finite temperature with dissipation, it's a very hard task. And, uh, and while holography in, in that sense is much easier. But I think you can make progress about that. Like it's the same, like, you know, it's all this project program of uh, writing uh, EFTs or hydrodynamics theory or dissipative theories in terms of effective field theories, which is uh, ongoing. But I agree, these I-form symmetries, actually they have a lot to do also with the topics that I spoke about because you can rewrite all the theory of elasticity in terms of an higher form uh, uh, theory. And this was done in a paper by Grozanov and Povutikul. And uh, it's something also that I think is highly unexplored. And uh, just to mention, so since you mentioned this theory, I think these theories are the way to go to introduce real phase relaxation. So it's pretty clear that phase relaxation should come from the breaking of these higher form symmetries. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the topic. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, are there more questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, then let's thank uh, Matteo once again. So thank you, Matteo. Thanks to you guys. Hope to see you soon somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So here we come to the end. So um, for this session, our next session will be 7.30 India time in three hours. Okay, I am so